Happy Friday, everyone. You know what that means, another live lawn care Q&A. My name is Ron Henry, and I am here to help answer your lawn care questions. Now, if this is the first time you're joining us, welcome. Super happy to have you here. The way this works is really simple. On your screen, you will see a chat box. In that chat box, you can enter your question, concern, comment of the day, and I work through them in the order that they come in. Now, sometimes I have the answer, sometimes I do not, but either way, we have a great time talking about lawn care and sometimes life. Guys, it is uh, it's March first, guys. So uh, you know we're, we're getting closer and closer to that to that good weather to get uh, get out there and start having fun in the lawn. Today was unusually cold. It's pretty cold here in Northeast Georgia. Cold, rainy, wet. I'll show you guys how rainy, how wet um, here in a little bit. I took some video and some pictures here earlier today. But overall, very excited. You know, March is here, and it's uh, it's a good time. It's a good time. So as always, we're coming to you guys live on YouTube as our primary platform. We're also streaming live on Facebook and Instagram. Something happened tonight with Twitter to where, you know, the Twitter, Twitter isn't, um, we weren't able to connect. So the three of you guys that watch this on Twitter, come over to one of those other platforms and that way you can be part of the conversation and we can have a great, a great time. All right, so that's what we have in the live stream this evening. You know, we have a couple of super chats. Actually, let me take care of those first before we get into our, our questions. Our first super chat of the evening comes from um, Chris Styles. Chris Styles four zero five. It's a good question. This is a good one because some of you guys probably also have the same thing. Anyone looking to get into real mowing? His question is: Super chat received. I'm thinking about buying a used Toro Greens Master one thousand off Craigslist. What are some things I should be looking for when buying a used real mower? Thanks. A great question, Chris. Uh, so. The number of hours is always good to look at. That's pretty obvious. So, you know, the lower hours, the better because there's less wear and tear on, on, the, on the engine, um, the drive system. Uh, the lot, depending on the year of the Greens Master you have, um, you know, the, it's, they're belt driven. So a lot of that stuff can be replaced. But as far as time, 
Um, the engine and drum and those types of things is what you're really looking for. Um, as far as other things I would check are, um, is, is the mower sharp? You know, is it is it cutting paper already? The reason for that is if it's not sharp, then that's something you have to factor in as far as, you know, an expense you're gonna have whenever you get the mower as far as getting it, um, getting it all set to go to get ready to cut. Um, if you can get the person to take pictures of it, make sure there's no, you know, chunks or, or, or gouges in the reel or bed knife because replacing those can be pretty expensive on a Greensmaster. So uh, th those are the primary things, you know, low hours, make sure it obviously it starts and runs. And then I would spend a lot of time just looking at the reel and bed knife, making sure again that it cuts paper all the way across and that there's no, uh, you know, obvious physical damage to either reel or bed knife because those are going to be the biggest expenses if you have to, you know, um, replace parts on the mower. So hope that helps, sir. A uh, great, great question. Great one to lead us off with on the for the show this evening. And again, if you if you decide to get it, take pictures and send, send it to us. We'll show everyone your new uh, your your new hardware. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, hopefully the pricing that you're that you're looking at is um is pretty good. Green Smashers, I mean, they're they're they are very reliable mowers. I mean, what we put them through on our residential lawns and our home lawns is nothing compared in comparison with their design to do. So. If you find one, relatively low hours, no damage, starts well. You know, as long as you take care of it, you're gonna get you're gonna get a long a long life out of it. So I mean, I, I love mine. My Greensmaster is um it runs it runs great. Uh, so yeah, hopefully you get one. All right, we have another super chat. This one is from Mr. Archie Amos. Super chat received. Calling out LG. LG, where you at? He says, where you been? A little poker tonight. Want to raise me? All right. Well, thank you guys, both Chris and Archie, for the super chats. A great way to start the show. I appreciate all of the love and support. And based on the Super Chat uh, numbers, Archie, you are currently our show sponsor. So there you go. Your name in lights for whatever that means to you. All right. So let's get back over here and we'll start digging into questions this evening, guys. Our first question comes from South Louisiana, Mr. Kyle Savant, or Savant. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. I'm sure you'll forgive me. He says, is it ever too late to apply pre-emergent? I haven't made the time to apply it and temps have been averaging in the 60 plus as far as soil temps go. Could a post-emergent treatment kill existing weeds and then pre-emergent? Yeah, so is it is it ever too late to apply it? Um, I mean, as far as getting good effectiveness, yeah. I mean, you, you wouldn't want to wait till till like summertime to apply pre-emergent um, if your goal is to prevent spring and summer weeds because they're largely going to have germinated by then. Is it too late for you to apply it? No, absolutely not. So I would still get it out. Yes, you are a little bit behind the curve as far as getting the most out of out of your the pre-emergent application as far as preventing spring and summer weeds. But your strategy makes a lot of sense to me. So if you got some weeds that are already showing up, you want to knock those back with an appropriate post-emergent herbicide. You can do that and then apply a pre-emergent to help you know slow down future weeds from coming in. So that absolutely makes sense, Kyle. It is not too late. I wouldn't wait much longer because the le the longer you wait, the less effective it is. So uh, so yeah, hopefully that helps her. Great question. Uh, get your pre-emergent out and uh, and yeah, you know enjoy as much as you can as far as a you know weed-free lawns which you can you can potentially get. But yeah, what you're what you're talking about doing. Um, is uh, is a good strategy. You know, so what some folks have done, I mean, I've actually done this. So when I've, um, so my next door neighbor, not Alex, the other one, uh, when they first moved in, I, I offered help with cleaning up the weeds in the lawn because the previous person moved out and they didn't have a lawn care service. So you pretty much had weeds all throughout the fall, winter, and in the springtime, you got a bunch of weeds in the lawn and, um, and they needed pre-emergent. So I did what you're talking about where I used a post-emergent herbicide. I used Celsius, Certainty, and then I used Prodiamine as the pre-emergent. Uh, I did a single application of that and did a great job doing uh, cleaning up the majority of the weeds in the um, in the lawn. I'm trying to think if I had to go back with Certainty again just for the Poanuum. I may have, but I mean, for the most part, doing what you're talking about, um, you know, mixing uh, Prodiamine uh, and, and post-emergent herbicides and spraying it all at once, that strategy can work. Uh, the only thing that I would say, and again, there's people that, that will disagree with this, but I, what I will say is that um, I would omit surfactant if you're going to go do that. Because of those two things, right, uh, of the pre-emergent and the post-emergent herbicides, the pre-emergent is more sensitive to timing. So like, you want to make sure that when you apply that, it gets in the soil. You're not doing anything to hamper it from getting in the soil, which a surfactant would do because it's going gonna, it's gonna to make some of the herbicides stick to the plant leaf, which what we don't want. We want it in the soil. Um, but if, But uh, yeah, if you're able to do that, you know, prodiamine and um, and uh, the appropriate post-emergent herbicides, that'll do a, a great job controlling existing weeds and then preventing more weeds going forward. So again, thank you for the super chat, uh, or not the super chat, but thank you for the question. It was a great question. And, uh, you know, if you need anything else, don't hesitate to uh, to reach out. So it sounds like you have a fun project 
for this weekend, right? Get your pre-emergent out and knock out, knock back some weeds. All right, so let's see what we, we have here on Instagram. We got some of you guys hanging out. We got uh, Take TX Real Man uh, saying, Happy Friday is greening up. It is. It is beginning to green up. My front lawn is starting to get a nice, getting the green fuzz. It's starting to look nice, which is good. I'm excited about that. Back lawn, not as much, but the front lawn is is uh, is looking, confidence is high. It's looking good. It's about where it needs, where it should be. Okay, next up, we have Adam Carter. Adam Carter has a question about Essential G. He says, hey, Ron, I bought the Essential G and I put down the entire bag at one time on 1,200 square feet because I was going to start putting down a bag a month. Is it okay to apply a whole bag on 1,200 square feet at one time? Yeah, there's no problem at all with that, um, Adam. You know, for people that are, are first starting out, they will they will tend to um, load with Essential G at a heavier rate. And then you could go down to a maintenance rate if you wanted to. So, you know, some people, uh, 10 pounds per thousand, uh, 20 pounds per thousand. In your case, you're going a bit heavier than that. Um, you're not. It's not going to hurt anything to uh, to do that. And if you want to keep it simple and just apply one bag per month, you can absolutely do that. When I've done top dressing, you guys have may have seen like the, the the longest video that I have on top dressing is from a few years back when I after I aerated the lawn and then I put applied essential G. I probably did seven or eight bags over over you know the entire lawn, maybe more. I think it's, it's at least. It's at least eight bags um, over the over the entire lawn, and that's if you think about that. For my lawn, by the numbers, uh, three bags will normally do it. I normally um, will do four. I'll do like three in the back, and then um, one in the front, and then one along the side. But um, but I guess what I'm trying to say is that going heavy is not gonna not gonna hurt anything. You're not gonna injure your lawn. You're not gonna burn anything. And it, especially whenever I do like a post core aeration or if I'm doing top dressing, that's when I'll go heavy with Essential G. So no problem at all with that. Uh, you know, enjoy, knock yourself out. It does make the math and, and, and the work a lot easier just knowing, hey, one bag per month and you should be good to go. So I would do that with Essential G. Don't do that with fertilizer, obviously, but Essential G, there's no uh, no issue with that uh, with that approach. Okay, uh, next up we have Fairway Bermuda. Daryl's in the house. What's going on, Daryl? Man, all, all the folks coming back, you can tell. You can tell it's about to be go time. You know, some of the YouTubers are, are waking up. Folks are coming, the, the regulars are starting to trickle back into the live stream, which is, which is good times. All right, so uh, Daryl is up. He says, uh, "What's up, Ron and everyone?" And uh, I call him Daryl, but his his YouTube channel is Fairway Bermuda Lawns. So if you want to see, you know, some more YouTube content on Bermuda grass, check out Daryl's channel. You know, he puts out puts out some good content. So get, get over there and support him. And then next up, we have Mr. Alex Ristano. Rist uh, Alex, one day you're gonna have to tell me how to pronounce your name properly. I think it's I think it's Ristano, but you know, hopefully you'll forgive me if I'm if I'm messing it up. So thank God it's Friday. Crew, I guess. I need something to do with my hands before the season started, so I have decided to convert my Fisker's Real Mower to electric. The parts are arriving tonight. I'll update next week. That's pretty cool, uh, Alex. You know, you're not the first to do that. Uh, there's a guy. What was his name? I used to, I used to mess with him all the time. Call him like Captain Crabgrass. He was out of Texas, I think. Um, that did that did that. So there's if, if in other words you. Um, I'm not sure if there's a kit that you're ordering or whatever, but the, it, what you're, you're not treading new ground. And from what I understand, it tends to work pretty well as far as, you know, concert, converting your Fiskars to an electric uh, reel mower. So keep us posted, man. Take pictures once it's all done and, and ready to go. Take pictures. So guys, with it being, you know, uh, with it being March 1st, you know, today would have been the day when I've done my first Essential G or app for like, you know, the, the, the start of the season, get things really going. I mean, I've been doing it monthly, but as far as like the, you know, the, the go time app, um, it would have been today, wasn't able to do that because of uh, Mother Nature had other ideas. And I'll show you guys why. So if you look at uh, this quick video here, I'll, I'll show you guys what the lawn was looking like this afternoon. So, so far, so good. But then we get to there and you can see that's a lot of rain. Like it's been raining all day, literally all day. And that's what the, uh, the, back, lawn, the back lawn looks like. So, um, so yeah. You know, big a big puddle. Obviously, I'm not going to be applying any essential G in that. So likely tomorrow. Lucky tomorrow is when it'll go down. So I'll get my first my first heavy app of it um, down. Um, what during the during the the off months when the when we're out of season, I tend to do like the the maintenance rate or lower rate. So this first you know heavier app for the season to get things going, I'll go uh, I'll go a bit heavier. So if you guys want to see that, I will. I'll do some YouTube shorts showing that as much as I can. If you guys care to see, but you guys have seen me apply essential G in the past. So that's, what's going to be going down. But yeah, today would have been the day, but not because, uh, again, mother nature had, had its, uh, had other ideas, you know, believe it or not, if you guys go back 
far enough into my content, you'll actually find a video of me applying Essential G in the rain, like when it's when it's cr raining like crazy like that. So if you look back far enough in, in as far as like a shorts go, you'll uh, you'll find one. But I just didn't I didn't have it in me today. And also the day when I did it, I didn't have a swimming pool in the lawn. So obviously that's not going to work. You can't you can't run a spreader through that or apply really anything granular in with that with that much uh, water on the lawn. So stay posted. All right, uh, next up, we have a question. This one is from Instagram, from Nefetz2609. Uh, he says, hey, Ron, when's a good time to put down uh, pesticides? Uh, Dallas Fort Worth area, about 60% green up already. So when you say pesticides, are you referring to insecticides? Uh, so if you're talking about insecticides, I like to apply a Celeprin uh, late March, early April. That's when I get my app out to, to get ahead of um, any potential grub grub damage. So if you're, it's a bit early, in my opinion, for you to do that, I would wait until late March, early April to, uh, to apply your acelaprin, your acelaprin. That's, uh, that's how my timing goes. So hope that helps, uh, sir. I mean, Dallas Fort Worth, you guys, you're, you're similar to us as far as, um, as far as like, uh, as far as temperatures. So yeah, I mean, I, I would wait. I, you're not, not quite ready yet. I would give it some more time. About a month or so from now is when you could look at getting your um your insecticide out if that's what you're asking me I'm, I'm assuming that's what you're what the question is all right next up we got mr oliver Rittum in the house talking about scalping and another question here so let's let's get to that he says plan to scalp this weekend my height of cut is normally three quarters of an inch 0. 0.750 and i want to do uh 0.62 so five eighths this spring my plan is to do 0. 0.75 to half an inch um okay to half an inch and then i guess to quarter of an inch uh, these increments over the next few days to prevent wearing down the blades. Thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, if you really, you could if you want to, Oliver. I mean, I don't, as long as you're not going to get into the dirt going from half an inch, from, from three quarters of an inch down to quarter of an inch, I mean, there's not really, um, I don't think you're really reducing the amount of wear. It's, it's, it's big thing is you don't want, you don't want to get into the dirt. So as long as you can cut your lawn at a quarter of an inch, you're certain about that and not get into any, uh, any soil then you're you're good to go. So you can step it down if you want, if you want to break it up in a couple of sessions, or you could just do it all in uh, in one in one go. Um, yeah. So it just really really depends on uh, on on what you're after. I don't know necessarily. I mean, a quarter of inch is. I don't know if that's really necessary if your if your plan is to go to to five eighths. But you know, it's completely up to you. Your lawn, I've seen it, and at least the front that I've seen looks pretty flat. So you can likely get away with it. But again, the big thing is just to keep the mower out of the dirt. Like don't get it into, into the dirt because that is going to, that's going to cause you to, to at a minimum have to do a back lap and possibly have to, to get send it out for a grind depending on how, um, you know, how, how bad it is. So, uh, so yeah, your plan makes sense. You might even be able to save some time and just go from 0.75 to a quarter. Really, really up to you. But here's the thing, stepping it down makes sense if you're not sure, right? So if you're not sure that you're, you can, you can cut it quarter of an inch without getting in the dirt, then yeah, step it down to, to um, half an inch, see how it does, maybe lower it another tenth and just see, maybe just slowly move it down just to see until, make sure that at, at a quarter you're not going to get into, um, to get into any, uh, any, any, tur any dirt by doing that. So, uh, so yeah, keep me posted as far as how it goes, man. Sounds like a, uh, a fun, sounds like a fun project. And he has another question. He says, uh, happy Friday, Ron. Always wondering what cultivar Bermuda I have. The yard was hydro seeded and not sod. I figured it would be common, but what kind? Is it Princess 77, Arden 15, Celebration considered common? Yeah, so it depends on who you ask about this. So um, as far as hybrids, from what I understand, like most hybrid Bermuda is, um, it's not available via seed, via grass seed. But if you look at like the literature on Princess 77 and Arden 15, they consider it a hybrid that you can grow from seed. So Celebration, I believe, is truly a hybrid. I, I didn't know, I, don't, I wasn't sure that there's ever a seed available for Celebration. I might be wrong on that, but I've never, I don't recall ever seeing Celebration grass seed. But Princess 77 and Arden 15, I'm very familiar with. And um, as far as the way they look, they they look a lot like a hybrid, like the 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 leaf texture of Princess 77 and Arden 15 is, is very fine. So it, it's, um, that's why those two, as far as blending, you know, reasonably well with say like Tifway 419, that's why they, why they worked well. Whereas if you look at some other Bermudas, like, um, like a Monaco, like Tahoma, like, I mean, they, they look good, but it's, uh, but it's the, the leaf blade tends to be a bit coarser. So it looks, they look more like a common than they do like a hybrid. So 
you know, you can only look at the literature. It's Prism 77, RN15, they call it a hybrid, but again, most most people, if you ask them about hybrid Bermuda grass, it, it's con typically considered that it's it's um it's available in sod form. So um Prism 77 and RN15 were kind of outliers in that in that regard. And you can't get them anymore, so that that's kind of a thing. Um as far as knowing what kind of grass you have, what kind of cultivar you have. I guess when was your house built? You know, that would be something to consider because Arden 15 is not or was not that old. Like Princess 70, I forget exactly when it came out, but it, it maybe uh, 2019, thereabouts. Um, it didn't stick around for very long. Princess 77 was around longer. So if it had to be one of them, I would I would venture more towards Princess 77 versus Arden 15, unless you're, again, unless your your, your house was recently built. Um, but what you might have, um, but you're, you're saying it was hydro seeded. So yeah, I mean, it, it, it could, it's hard to say exactly what it is, man. Um, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, if it's a finer leaf blade, it could be, it could be Princess 77. And if it's a newer property, it could be Arden 15. But I mean, Arden 15, again, did not stick around for, uh, for very long. So, sorry, I'm not more help on that. I don't know if you can actually take, you know, your, your grass and send it out. I don't know if most extension offices even offer a service for doing that kind of analysis. So I'm not sure how you can determine exactly what kind you have. Um, even if you did, I don't know if it, how it would really change how you would you would take care of the the lawn. You know what I mean? Like this is your you've been doing this for a couple of years now. I think as far as your Primo, your growth regulator apps, like you've gotten good results with that because that's really the biggest difference, right? So between hybrid Bermuda and common Bermuda, the rates for Primo are quite a bit higher for common than for hybrid. So if you're using hybrid rates over the past couple of years and you've gotten good regulation with that, then you'd likely have some kind of a hybrid and I would just keep keep rolling with what you're doing. Outside of that, everything else is, is the same, you know? So, sorry, I'm not, I don't have a, a better answer for you, but, uh, but hopefully that gives you some um, some ideas to, to kind of to kind of think about. All right, uh, next up, we got Papa Mo's Low. Papa Mo's Low is in the, in, here on the gram. What's going on, Papa Mo's Low? Hopefully you're doing all right. Next, we got Mr. Archie Amos in the live stream. It's a good question. He says, when is a good time to begin putting down the carbon kit? If so, with uh, regularity, what regulator would you suggest? Yeah, so on the front lawn, I am likely gonna hit the car hit it with the carbon kit this weekend because the front lawn is, is really starting to get green all throughout it, which makes me happy. And uh, so, yeah, for I'd say your, your, your lawn will tell you, Archie. Um, my front lawn is is ahead of the back lawn uh, this year. It normally is. So for the front lawn, we'll get uh, we'll get the carbon kit. The entire lawn will get essential G. So really, when your lawn is waking up, you're starting to see green throughout it. That is when I would apply the carbon kit. I'm a fan of the lawn of the, the turf actually being actively growing before you know you start putting out the um, the foliar sprays. So hope that helps, sir. Great question. Um, and you know, let your uh, let your lawn let your lawn be your guide as far as as far as when to start introducing the carbon kit. You're not here's the thing: it's not going to hurt anything if your lawn is still waking up to apply it. But as far as getting the most out of it, I prefer to wait until you're starting to see green the lawn. The lawn's starting to come out of dormancy. Then you can give it a nice you know a nice little taste of uh, of that goodness to get to get things going. All right, next up, we have Jason Harrison. And guys, I'm trying to go faster tonight, so I don't have to have you guys up quite so late, but we're gonna, we're gonna try. I'm gonna try not to, to pontificate too much. But Jason Harrison's up next, he says, uh, just checking in and saying hello, trying to be patient and to appreciate the calm before the work of the impending season truly begins. It's hard though, I love the process and I'm happy it's nearing. Well, you can get out there and put some essential G down this weekend if you want to, Jason. There's no, no issue with doing that. No issue with doing that at all. And then uh, next up, we have Archie Amos. We've had this question before, but we will cover it again because I'm sure other folks are wondering as well. He says, evening, young man, what are the negative effects of exceeding the annual limits of pre-emergence? So it, it depend, if you, depending on how far you go over, you can cause root clubbing issues or you can, you can cause damage to the, to the grass roots. Um, for grasses like Bermuda, you can, um, in extreme cases, you can, you can have issues with the, the stolons or the runners being able to, to tack down properly. Um, and it's just, you don't really get more out of it by doing that. Like, I mean, it's like, you, you, you ask this question for pre-emergent, but really it could be applied to anything. You know, like when it comes to herbicides, fertilizer, insecticides, pretty much any inputs you make to your, to your soil, um, and then by extension, the grass, like there are limits. There's a Goldilocks zone where you, where 
a nut where if you stay within that, you get a beneficial effect. And if you exceed that, you start to get negative effects. And it's not one of those things where more is better. So a good example, look at like fertilizer, right? If you over apply fertilizer, it's not like the lawn is going to is going to get like that much greener. In, many, in extreme cases, you're going to burn it. You're going to burn it, cause damage. Um, so with pre-emergent, I would stay within the uh, the annual limits. That's why uh, I'm a big fan of rotating pre-emergents. So whenever in the springtime, um, I like to apply prodiamine at the higher rate. So for my grass type, that's like 0.83 per thousand. And then what that means is in the fall, I, I have to rotate to something else, like um, in my case, like Spectacle Flow, right? So it's really not hard, Archie, to stay under the annual limits if you just find like two pre-emergents to balance between uh, for between spring and, and fall. Um, but like like anything else in life, like, you know, there's a there's a, there's a certain amount that is beneficial. And then when you go over that, you start to have negative effects. Like, I, like a good example I give is like, we all know that drinking water is good for you, but if you drink, you can actually drink enough water to the point, uh, especially if you do it too quickly um, at a point where it can become toxic. You know, vitamin C is good for you. Any, like most vitamins are good for you, but then again, taken to excess, they, they're no longer beneficial. They can become toxic. So it's the same thing with, with, um, with pre-emergent. In addition to, you know, you're just putting a lot more herbicide into the soil than is called for. Like the label, the label, the EPA all say, you know, you can use this much of the product um, per, per, per year, per every 12 month period. And so don't exceed that. Um, there's not benefits. There's no, there's not benefits to going heavier than the, uh, than the, than the annual limits. The biggest thing as far as getting the most out of your pre-emergent is just timing. Like make sure you apply it when soil conditions and soil temperatures are correct. That's going to do more for you than trying to go like heavy handed with the, uh, with the application. So long, short, I wouldn't do it. Don't, don't over apply your, um, your, your pre-emergent. All right, so we got Offroad NV. He says, um, hey, Ron, I hope you're doing well. We look forward to Friday. Yeah, man, thanks. Thanks so much, Offroad NV. I'm not doing bad, not doing bad. All right, hanging in there. And then next up, Archie is back. He's back. He says, thinking about doing a second scalp now that I see the green haze. Would that be too much? No, not at all, Archie. So what, what some people do is they will do a an early scalp before or an early cleanup of the lawn before they apply their pre-emergent. So if you're like me and you like to apply your pre-emergent a bit earlier, so like in the February time frame, you'll either turf rake or do a light scalp just to get debris out of the lawn and, and just improve um, the ability for your pre-emergent to work well. And then they'll save like the real scalp until like now, like March's time frame, right? So um, to answer your question, no, it's not too much. Uh, my recommendation is to aim for a quarter to a half an inch at the most beneath where you want to maintain the lawn. So, you know, really, if you're going to keep maintain the lawn at three quarters of an inch, you go to half an inch and that would be just fine. Let it grow back in and you're going to be you're going to be good to go. So great question. Um, you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully you can have some fun tomorrow out there uh, scalping your lawn. So enjoy if that's what your your, your plan is to do. And, again, and would you are not going to be treading new ground by by doing that if that's what you're um, that's what you're want you're, uh, you're you're wondering not not at all i mean most people most people will do only one but some folks that are um that are really particular will do one a light one earlier in the season and then the main one uh, this time of year so yeah no uh, no issues at all with doing that jackie beers in the house he says let's go what's going on jackie thanks for coming by and saying hello appreciate you and then next up we have uh will covey I think your, your, your questions came out of order, Will. So I'm going to read the second one first. I think that is when, that's the order that you, you did post them in. All right, so the first one says, when should I plant, actually, no, this is correct. He says, hey, Ron, I have some bare spots from fall overseed of turf type tall fescue. I'm looking to fill in uh, these areas with a spring seeding using the pre-germinating method, which I had much success with in the fall. Uh, when should I plant the seed? I know it has to be earlier than later, so it has a chance to survive the summer, but how early in Northern Virginia? Thanks. So here's the thing, Well, I don't really have any direct experience when it comes to, um, to, to turf type tall fescue grass seed as far as timing behind it. What I would do is look at the, um, like the bag that you have, the grass seed you have is going to have a soil temperature range that it's going to recommend for getting good germination. If where you are in Northern Virginia, the temperatures are in that range, then I would go out, go out and get it. And to your point, yes, for fescue, you know, you want to get it out to where it has enough time to, to grow in and to where it has a, does a, has a pretty good chance of surviving uh, the summer. 
the fescue tends to do pretty well. Here in Georgia, again, you don't really see ryegrass outside of like fall overseas. You don't see Kentucky bluegrass as far as, you know, a few people here, here and there that will do it for a fall overseed. But you do see fescue, right? So I, as long as you're able to get it to grow in, again, you're in Virginia, so it's not going to be quite as, as hot as what we have here. But as long as you're able to get it to, to begin growing, which fescue doesn't take that long to germinate, you should be fine by summertime. Um, the best answer to your question, though, is to look at the look at the bag and see what it says as far as the soil temperatures they recommend. For Bermuda grass, like Arden 15, um, Princess 77, the recommended soil temperatures are like the mid 60s, trending warmer. You can for fescue, it's likely going to be quite a bit cooler than that. But I don't know off the top of my head um, what temperature, what soil temperature you gotta you want to go for for a um, for growing in fescue. So, um, so yeah, so sorry, I'm not more help on that one. The bag should tell you. Worst case, you can also just give the manufacturer, like whoever you got the grass seed from or, you know, whatever brand it is, give them a call real quick. Most of them have a helpline. You can ask them, hey, you know, I'm, I'm planning on get, I want to begin growing this as soon as possible to get it ready for the summer so it can be healthy for summer months. And uh, they'll be able to tell you, yeah, soil temperatures of this is what you should be aiming for and you'll be good to go. And yeah, keep me posted as far as how it goes. A lot of folks are talking about that as far as the, the hydro seeding that you're that you just referenced. So if you got good results with it in the fall, you know, I, I'm not sure if you tracked what the soil temperatures were then when you when you did it as far as getting it to grow in. I mean, I imagine they'd be the same thing like now, right? For springtime. Uh, but again, if you're not sure, check the label or call the manufacturer and they'll be able to tell you like what soil temps they recommend for for best results. All right, next up, we got Mr. Tom Hoffenkamp in the house. He says, hey, Ron and lawn fans, can I just use nitrogen in the air to fertilize the lawn? Apparently, it's 78% N. Hmm. I, I don't know, Tom. I mean, I guess technically you shouldn't, you would have to do anything then, right? I mean, it would just, it would just pull it out of the air and that would just be the way it would work. That'd be, that's, that's a very low effort uh, form of fertilization, right? Uh, but yeah, no, I don't think it quite works that way, Tom. But if you try it and it works, you let me know. Uh, but I, I think you're going to be disappointed with the results if you rely on that uh, on that method. All right, next up, we got Mr. Robert Rainey in the house saying, "Good evening. What's going on, Robert? Hopefully you're doing well. You getting ready, man? You getting ready to put a, put the herding on that on that beautiful lawn of yours? It's getting close. We're in March. We're in March. You know what that means? You got to get there and, and and spray out that beautiful ryegrass lawn you got there. You want to get it? You want to get that get that gone so the Bermuda can wake up." I know it's going to pain you. Be sure to take pictures so we can all, you know, we can all suffer together. We don't want you to be there on an island by yourself watching your beautiful ryegrass lawn begin turning brown as it dies off. We, we want to be here with you. We can be your support system and be, man, it looks so good. You know, we'll, we'll, hold, up, we'll hold up our drinks. We'll, and we'll have a moment of silence for the, uh, for the beautiful ryegrass going away. So don't, don't suffer alone. Let us be part of, of that, uh, that process. All right, next up, uh, we have Mr. Mark Luna. He says, let's get it. What's going on, Mark? Thanks for coming to hang out in the live stream, sir. I appreciate you. And then uh, Lon Guido is up. He says, uh, my soil test results came back. I need macronutrients. What should I apply? Question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. Um, so if you need um, all the macros, your nitrogen, your phosphorus, your potassium, um, Lon, what I would say is go with a fertilizer like our 14714. So I'll show you really quick here if we go to the golf course lawn store, go to shop and then go to lawn fertilizer. There you will see this guy, the complete 14714, which has all your macros, 14% nitrogen, 7% phosphorus, 14% potassium, along with some iron, some magnesium. It's got some humic acid in it. It's got some kelp um, in it. So it's, it's, a it's a great fertilizer from a standpoint of addressing your macronutrient deficiencies. And it also, you know, it's got some, some biosimilants to help improve um, nutrient uptake and, and just help you get more out of the uh, out of the product. So this is what I would go with if um, I haven't seen your soil test results, but based on what you're saying, you need all the macros. That is what I would apply. So if you are so interested, sir, I will send you a link to where you can pick that up. And that's what I would what I would roll with. Depending on how how low your phosphorus is, um, you might use that. I mean, if it's very low, you may use that for you know. Three, I use it the entire season, but if you're if you want to see when you can wean off of a fertilizer with uh, with phosphorus in it, I would say do like three applications and then do another soil test and see where your your levels are then, and then you could transition from something like the fourteen seven fourteen to Humic Max, which is just a nitrogen and potassium fertilizer. So that's how I would go about it. Again, I haven't seen your soil test results, so I don't know how how low the levels are, but um, but yeah, if you're if you're looking to 
just you know raise your phosphorus you know three apps three three months of, of applying it and then test and then you can you can make adjustments um, after that so hope that helps sir good job getting the soil test done yay for that all right next up is Mark he says looking forward to another great stream hit that like button well I, I don't know how great it's going to be Mark but it will be a live stream so you have to let me know at the end of the night how good or bad a job. I did. So guys, we have 127 people of you guys in the live stream right now, only 74 likes. So certainly we could do better than that. If you guys are enjoying the show, or you just want a, uh, an inexpensive, aka free way of supporting the live stream, hit that like button. It is absolutely free to do, costs you absolutely nothing, and uh, you know sends good vibes to YouTube, and I'd really, really appreciate it if you guys could do that for me. All right, next up, we have Michael Kuhn. Um, he says, it's a good question. He says, do you need to wait a certain period of time before mowing after spraying for weeds? Does the entire weed essentially become, um, I guess, infected down to the root after spraying? It's a great question, Michael. So the, the general guidance is if you can wait a few days before spraying to mow and a few days after spraying to mow, that is gonna produce the best result. Reason being is if you think about like how most post-emergent herbicides work, you spray them and they cover the plant leaf, the skin of the of the, the weed you're targeting, right? So the more leaf, more leaf you have, the um, you know the more surface area you have for it to take for it to absorb the herbicide and then ultimately control the uh, the, the weed you're trying to get rid of. So from the time you spray, I would give it two days, like a minimum a minimum of two days after spraying. Uh, before you um, mow the lawn again. So say you sprayed tomorrow morning, you would not mow until like Tuesday, Tuesday at best. And then if you really can wait a little bit longer till, um, till Wednesday, like the longer you wait, the more, you know, you're going to allow the, the plant to take that up and for it to, for it to work into the, um, work through the plant and then ultimately kill it. So the, so the idea is right. If you, you spray, um, let's say you're, you're, you're trying to control a well, spurge is not a great idea, but we'll use spurge as an example, right? Let's say you're trying to control spurge and you spray it, you wait a couple of days, and then you mow it. So you think about that. At that point, the, that plant, the, the spurge is now sick, it's injured. And then when you mow it, it's gonna make it even more difficult for it to grow back. You know what I mean? So you've already injured it with the herbicide, you cut it off, and as it attempts to grow back, it's just gonna have a, it's gonna have a more difficult time uh, doing that. So I would say two days, two days minimum between the time you spray to the time you um, you begin your mowing is going to produce uh, produce good results. That's what I've done, um, you know, for years, and it it works it works really well. If you can, a couple of days before would be good too, right? Because you think about it, if you mow say the day before, mow the entire lawn the day before you're going to go spray for weeds, you've cut a lot of the leaf off. You know what I mean? So the idea is, a, a few days before and a few days after, if you can, is going to produce the best results for controlling uh, for controlling weeds with uh, with a post emergent herbicide. So a good question. Hope that helps, and um, you know, get out there and and knock knock the weeds back out of your lawn. Weeds are no fun. So, all right. Next up is, is Gladiator three ninety two. He says, Hey Ron, is it time to put down pre emergent to kill weeds? A great question, Gladiator uh, three ninety two. So, is it time to put down pre emergent? Depends on where you are in the country. If you're in the southeast United States, yes. But again, pre-emergent isn't a post-emergent herbicide. It doesn't really kill weeds as much as prevent them. You know what I mean? So it's kind of in the name. It's it's a type of herbicide that is most effective prior to the weeds emerging. So if you've already got weeds in your lawn, you're already staring at them, pre-emergent isn't going to do a whole lot for you, right? That's when you have to use like a post-emergent herbicide that is safe for your grass type and that is labeled to control the weed that you're after to get rid of the weeds that you're now seeing. But if you're trying to prevent new weeds from going in, then yes then pre-emergent is the tool you're going to want to, to use from that. Uh, um, as far as the, uh, the the timing for it, for spring pre-emergent, for like say something like prodiamine, you want to, to get it uh, applied in, in the soil before the average soil temps are in the mid-50s. That's when weeds like crabgrass begin to germinate. So the average five-day you want to um, you want to get your your pre-emergent applied prior to that. So as far as what that looks like for me is whenever the average five day is like in the high 40s, low 50s, I go ahead and get my pre-emergent out. For me, that works out to normally in the, the first part to middle of February. Um, that's worked well for me in the past because again, when it comes to pre-emergent, to get the most benefit, you want it in the soil prior to the weeds emerging. Right? It's, again, it's kind of kind of like in the name. So. Hopefully that helps as far as answering your question. Um, is it time to put down pre-emergent? It depends. I mean, if you're in the Southeast, the answer is yes. 
And but it's not to kill weeds; it's more to prevent weeds. There's there's a couple of pre-emergents that have a bit of post-emergent control. So like uh, Dithiapyr is one that comes to mind, where it is you know primarily a pre-emergent, but it also has the ability to control young crabgrass. But you really don't want to use it for that purpose. You know what I'm saying? It's not like you, you're going to say, "Oh, I've got crabgrass in the lawn. I'm going to go out and put out Dithiapyr." The real thing that it's designed for is for preventing weeds in the first place. You got some young crabgrass, it can take care of that, but the big thing is you're using it to, as a tool to prevent weeds from uh, from growing into your lawn. So hope that helps, great question. Again, pre-emergent is not to kill existing weeds in your lawn, it's to prevent new ones from growing in, kind of like the name the name implies. So um, so hopefully that, that, that helps you out. And as far as post-emergent herbicides, um, you, didn't, you didn't ask this, but as far as um, the ones that I like, if you're going to, if you have warm season grass, like so Bermuda, Zoysia, St. Augustine, Centipede, um, the for broadleaf weed control, I'm a huge fan of Celsius. The nice thing about this is you can spray it over a broad temperature range and with very little chance of injury to your grass. You know, I actually got a um, uh, um, a, a an email from a, a viewer today who's in Arizona, and he was saying, he, he was telling me, you know, for years I've tried different types of uh, post emergent herbicides. I've tried the stuff from the big box stores. And every time I do that, I, I use those, they would, they would damage my lawn. It would kill the weeds, but it would turn, you know, it would discolor the grass. He said, last year I tried Celsius for the first time and I couldn't be happier. It did exactly what it's designed to do control the weeds while not, you know, injuring or damaging the grass. So if you've got broadleaf weeds and you've got warm season grass, uh, Celsius um, is what I would use. And then if you're looking to control sedges, and poannua, and it covers other weeds as well too, but the primary thing that Certainty is known for is for sedge control and also poa, um, this is what I would use. The nice thing is, is if you're looking for like a great combination that can do, you know, broad spread cleanup in a lawn, um, this combination is, is pretty sweet. And the nice thing is neither of them have any label temperature restrictions. You can spray them over, again, you can spray them now, you can spray them in the summertime. Um, and they, you know, they, as far as the, the chance of injury to your lawn, it's far, far less than what you will get out of, say like, um, like a three-way. So um, that's something to consider if you are looking to control weeds that are in your lawn. If you got cool season grass, you could use like a, a three-way, you could use tenacity, and then for sedge control, you could you would use something like uh, like sedge hammer. This is labeled for use on cool season and warm season grass, but if you got warm season grass, I would use certainty because this, while well, sedge hammer is okay, it just works really, really, really slow. And certainty controls more, um, more weeds than sedge hammer does. So if you got warm season grass, congratulations, you won the lottery, the herbicide lottery anyway, use this. Um, if you've got cool season grass, use sedge, sedge hammer and um, and tenacity, or sedge hammer and some you know some kind of a three way, depending on what you're trying to take care of. So, uh, great question. Hope that helps. And now you, now you have the information to go forth and conquer, as a gladiator should, right? All right, Vahid now he's up next. He says, "Hey everybody, what's going on, Vahid? Hopefully you are doing all right." And then next up is Colin. C. Pims is in the house. I got your pictures, Colin. I'm going to show folks. He says, what's up, Ron? Hopefully your Friday has been well. This Friday has been a bit, bit challenging, but hey, this too shall pass. It'll be better going forward, right? He says, ready for a good lawn care talk. I appreciate that, uh, Colin. So, you know, you guys know Colin is the guy out of, I believe you're out of California, right? That has um, the Paspalum lawn. And he, sh you know, I guess he wanted to, to, to hurt my heart a little bit and say, hey, when you say your lawn is dormant, like when I, when I hear a dormant lawn, this is what I think about when I think about dormant, right? Like brown, like, you know, not, not loving life. There's no green in it, anywhere in it. I mean, it still looks pretty. The stripe action is still on point. Don't hate on that. But I mean, that's what I consider dormant. His idea of dormant is something more like this. This is his idea of dormant. Like, I, I would take that all day long if I could have that. But this is his lawn. He says, hey, I want to show you what my lawn looks like when it's dormant and, um, you know, cry, cry me a river. You still got green in your lawn, so you can't, you really can't complain. Thanks for sending the picture, man. I'm sure uh, other folks that, like like me, have a, uh, a brown back lawn anyway right now would appreciate the fact that at least someone is, uh, is having a lot more green in their lawn than we are. All right, next up is our fragrance journey. Uh, roll tide. Look, guys, you know what? We're going to have to have, you know, we have to start having some guidelines. You know, the, the you Alabama folks, every time y'all kind of going to come in the live stream, you want to like shout out your football team. I realize I may have spoke, you know, I may have talked a bit more trash than I should have about the dogs in Alabama last year and all this kind of stuff. But can we just, can we, can we just, you know, be friends? Can we consider, can we just, you know, chill on all the, all the roll tide stuff? I mean, come on, it's not necessary. And again, 
I'll tell you this, if you guys keep it up, because I can't really control what you guys say, I can't keep it, if you guys keep it up, and, and, you know, if if this year without St. Nick there, you guys have a bad season, no, you're going to hear about it. So just, you have to ask yourself, do you want to, you guys want to continue this or do you want to just, you know, you want to pull it back? All right, Our Fragrance Journey says, uh, thanks for all you do for the community. I appreciate it. And uh, even though you're not a Bulldogs fan, I'll still, I'll still forgive you. And, uh, you know, we'll see what kind of season the, uh, the team from Alabama has. All right, next up is uh, uh, SJ. Um, this is a good one. He says, what, what are your top uh, three grass types? Cool, warm season, and why? Ooh. Um, okay, so for warm season, it's not gonna be much of a surprise. Um, I really like Bermuda, though I have to say last year I have taken a liking to the um, to the compadre zoysia. You know that seeing that um, get neglected a bit and that you can still cut it down and it still maintains its color was pretty cool. But for warm season grass, I'm gonna have to go with Bermuda. No surprise there. For cool season grass, I like ryegrass, man. Ryegrass just looks looks gorgeous. looks looks pretty. Stripes well. Uh, ryegrass would be my um, my cool season grass fave. Um, and then I guess the third. Let's see. We'll we'll we'll, we'll pick one for those folks that um, that have a lot of shade. So I guess fescue. So um, as far as like real mode golf course lawn look uh, grass for warm season Bermuda. But again, that's you guys knew that was going to be a thing. And then for um, cool season grass, um, rye grass, I figure if it's good enough for the master, it's good enough for me. And then for the um, for the rough of our golf course, fescue, and also because you can grow it in in the shade. So I think those three um, cover cover all your bases. Kentucky bluegrass looks great too. It's a pretty it's pretty looking grass as well. Um, but I, I like ryegrass. I, I like the way ryegrass looks more so than um, than KBG. So I'm I'm probably in the minority on that one. But I, I really like how ryegrass looks. So Bermuda, ryegrass, perennial ryegrass, and um, and fescue. Those would be those would be my go-to's because between those three, you're pretty much covered as far as um, you can you can go one of those pretty much anywhere. All right. Next up is John Stewart. He said, <laughs> received this week the coveted bling stickers. Thanks, Ron. You're very, very welcome, uh, John. Yeah, whenever the um, whenever the you know our, our person that does the order fulfillment, uh, you know they they said there's some guy John that placed an order and he says he says like um, please include bling sticker. What's he talking about? And I said oh, I know I know what he's talking about. So I'm glad you got it. Glad it made it to you. Uh, hope we got a good laugh out of it. And again, thank you for all all the support. Glad it made it in um, in good shape. Good stuff. All right, uh, our fragrance journey. I uh, said, uh, 73 people watching this, 35 likes. Let's get those likes up, fam. Definitely. Let's get them up, man. Get them up, get them up, get them up. So you're not all bad. Even though you're a Bama fan, I may have to take it back because you are you are helping to lead the charge uh, as far as getting the likes up. Even though you're a Bama fan, we'll, you know, we'll, 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 we'll overlook it for, for tonight. All right, Luis is in the house. Luis Ayabareño, he says, good evening. All sent out sold tests yesterday. Excited to get the results and getting started soon. Very, very cool, man. And that's a good way to start the season. Get your soul test done so you're not guessing, right? The benefit of soul testing is as far as being able to answer the question, what type of fertilizer should I be using on my lawn? Soil tests will give you the answer to the question, right? So as far as, you know, if you don't want to be that person when you're ordering fertilizer online or if you're going to the big box store, wherever you happen to get your fertilizer, to know exactly what the best fit is for your particular uh, lawn, you know, a soil test is... Um, Cheap investment, less is not not expensive for for the the value you get you get out of them. So good job, Louise. As as far as the um, you know one of the things that I, I teach at the Golf Course Lawn Academy, like in like February last month, the two things that folks were doing if they're following the calendar is in your if you're in the Southeast United States, you're applying your pre-emergent and you were doing a soil test. So good good stuff, uh, Louise. Good jo good job getting your uh, your soil test done. All right, next up is Tom V. He says. Soil test planned this weekend. Once that is done, planning some dethatching. We'll then apply essential G for the first time ever. Looking forward to the season. Good stuff, Tom. So when you say uh, dethatching, I, I the thing I would I would say, I mean, you didn't ask this, but I would recommend is don't go too aggressive. You know, most people call dethatching, they call turf raking. Um, or scarifying dethatching. So if you're gonna if you're doing like turf raking where you're just lightly trying to remove, you know, 
old debris from the um, and dinner material from the lawn. Like I'm all about that. But as far as like like true dethatching, where you're using the machine with like the solid blades and and like the hooked end, that's that's really aggressive. Uh, you know, just I I would say be careful. Most lawns do not need that. Most lawns don't require that. So, you know, I, I'd say whatever whatever you're doing, don't go too aggressive. It's it'd be better to make a couple of light passes than go super heavy and just try and you know do a lot of I mean could potentially end up being damaged and stress to the turf is that's kind of unnecessary. In other words, you may not get what you're looking to get out of it if you if you go too aggressive. So. Sounds like a good time, man. Good job on getting your soil test done. And uh, yeah, let me know how it does as far as the um, the turf raking slash dethatching uh, work and when you get your essential G out. Next up, Mr. No Names in the house is, hey, Ron and fellow lawn enthusiasts, the 2024 season is here. Let's get those likes up. Thanks so much, No Name. Yeah, today, today, if you're following the calendar, you know, today you'd be getting your essential G out. So this weekend is going to be a fun time for any Golf Course Lawn Academy members. We're going to be out there putting down that good, good, that good stuff. And next up is Devin. Devin's in the house. So guys, um, you know, I, I've been chatting with him back and forth, and it looks like next week, for all you cool season folks, and all you guys, are, you feel like you're not getting the love. You say, oh, all you ever talked about is like warm feet in the grass and Thoysia and Bermuda. You know, we got, we need, we need love too. So next week, uh, Devin, who is a cool season grass expert, he runs a golf course. He takes care of the the, the greens and the, just the everything green that's growing on the course out of uh, out of Colorado Springs. He's going to be on the live stream next week. Um, we've confirmed it, got him locked down. Again, barring, barring anything crazy that happens, but he should be on the live stream next week. So you guys that have cool season turf grass, definitely tune in for that because he is going to be uh, on next Friday. Uh, I guess it's going to be the 8th. I think it's the 8th. The 8th to uh, to talk, to take all your cool season questions and, uh, and yeah, just in general to talk about talk about topics that, that I don't, I don't typically cover. So it should be a good time. So yeah, Devin. So thanks for coming to hang out, man. It should be a good night of turf talk. And again, looking forward to having you on the live stream last, uh, next week. A lot of folks are looking forward to it. So it should be a lot of, a lot of fun. All right. So we have a comment here over on the gram. This one is from Shauna. She says, Hey Ron, is that uh 14714 good to feed all season? Yes, it is. You can use it all season long. Um, on phosphorus and the prill size is amazing. I agree. Prill size is amazing. As far as you know, the, the fertilizer getting into the soil where it can work, that that greens grade prill is, is a thing of beauty. So if you guys don't know what um what Shauna is talking about, so this is I'll show you guys with a little, little show and tell. This is the prill size for most fertilizers that you guys will, like, will encounter, right? This is like a 210 SGN, like size guide number. This is what the size of fertilizer prills that most of you guys get, you buy it online or you go to your big box stores is what you're dealing with. Um, the fertilizer, the first one that we carried or the one that we that we are, we were able to carry from Lebanon on the Golf Course Lawn Store is Humic Max. This is 150 SGN. So if you look at that, that's what you would normally get from the big box stores. This is the smaller prill that comes in Humic Max. So why is that important? You think if, if you think about it from a standpoint of especially low cut turf, but really applies to all, all turf grass, is this stuff needs to get, the prill, the fertilizer needs to get into the soil. It doesn't do you a whole lot of good if it's sitting on top of the grass, on top of the canopy. So a smaller prill, due to physics, makes it easier to get past the grass into the soil than a larger prill, right? So this is what you, standard fertilizer um, prill size, this is Humic Max. So what Shauna was asking about is another another um, product that we also carry. So the the Stress twelve zero the twelve twelve zero fourteen and also the fourteen seven fourteen. The one I was just showing you earlier are what's considered a greens grade prill. So if you look at this, this is one hundred fifty SGN, and then this is eighty. So if you look at the difference between that, this is very this is already very fine. This is almost I mean I don't say it's almost like powder, but it's in, incredibly fine. So as, as a as a point of reference. This is a pen, or the, the tip of a pen. So you can see this is 210 SGN. And sorry, you can't see this, Shauna, but this is like a 210 SGN. And you can see the tip of a pen compared to those prill. This is 150 SGN. So this is Humic Max, right? You can see like the prills are quite a bit smaller than just the tip of this pen. And then finally, you have the greens grade fertilizers, which it's like not even the same thing. And you figure you probably put, you know, 10, 10 of those, 10, 10 or more of those on the tip of a pen. So get to as a point of reference to show you um, the differences in size. I can't hold all of them at the same time, but actually I might be able to. So what you normally get, Humic Max, and then the 14714 and the 12. So um, so yeah. 
These guys are great. The nice thing is, if again, if you've got, if you real mow your lawn, if you got tight, you know, you know, tight turf, um, this stuff is gonna is gonna get past the, the canopy into the soil where it can work. And even if you've got a lawn that's got like a, a fescue lawn, if you're mowing your grass at you know three inches, four inches, it's still still good. It works on all all grass types. So um, so yeah, so that's what Shauna was talking about as far as the um, the prill, the fertilizer size and. We are very, very fortunate, very blessed that um, that Lebanon allowed us to to carry to carry their products and make them make them available to you guys. At first, you know, Humic Max was all they would do because I said, "Hey, man, we want the greens grade stuff too." They're like, man, do they really? You think your audience really would care about the smaller one? I'm like, listen, man, we we're right in. You may not realize it, but we 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 know the good stuff when we see it. And you know, it's been very well received. And yes, Shauna, the 14714 and the 12024 are both that that um that 80 SGN, the greens grade pro. So. And yes, you can use it year-round, year-round. Or so you can use it whenever your grass is actively growing. It's a better answer for it. You can use it throughout the entire season if it's a good fit for your soil based on soil test results. So good stuff. All right, next up, we have Eric Klein. Eric Klein is in the house. He says, sit up here. Oh. I have a cool season lawn in Tennessee. Cut to a quarter inch and all summer long. That's baller. It's pretty amazing. I says, I have to fight mildew in the morning that kills the grass daily if I don't wipe um, wipe it or mow it. Any suggestions? Mm, well, I mean, so you you say it kills the grass daily. Um, what, what I would say, or I, I don't know what kind of grass you have, Eric. Um, what I would say is this, if you're not using um, fungicides regularly, it's something you're going to want to look into doing, given that you're trying to maintain the lawn at at a quarter at a quarter of an inch. So you think about it, right? Um, for for maintaining the grass at higher cutting heights, and by higher I mean like say three quarters of an inch, um, you're typically able to get by with a fungicide app in you know a, a couple of apps in say May and June time frame, and then you're pretty much good until the fall months, whenever you're looking to prevent uh, you know diseases like spring dead spot. Um, the, the thing with mowing lower, while it's really cool, the, the lower you mow your grass, the more you have to do. So I always used to say the more the lower you go, the more you have to mow. A more accurate way of saying it is the lower you go, the more you have to do. So for example, on greens, like they'll spray fungicides, you know, every month. You know, sometimes every every three weeks, every every few weeks, they're out there spraying fungicides to help keep disease at bay, mainly because the turf is so much more stressed when it's cut that short. It's being mowed at least once a day. You maintaining your lawn at a quarter of an inch, I imagine you're mowing it daily. You know, I am at least during the summer months anyway. So if you're not using fungicide, I would look into doing that. If your goal is to continue to maintain the lawn at that that short of cutting height. Um, given that you're injuring it so frequently with um, with all the mowing, you're gonna want to use some kind of a fungicide or introduce fungicides into your into your program to see if that helps with the uh, with the disease problem that you're dealing with. Another thing I'd say is, and you probably already know this, but make sure your equipment is sharp. Like it's gotta, it's got to, it has to absolutely stay sharp if you're going to um, if your goal is to try and maintain a lawn at a quarter of an inch. So. You know, every time before you go out, you know, you do your paper test, make sure there's cutting paper all the way across because that's going to help minimize injury to the turf, which is going to minimize the chances of, of you know, you having disease problems. Um, as far as fungicides go, if you're looking for a good liquid fungicide, uh, one that, um, that I'm a fan of is Pillar SC. Um, this is a great um, preventative and curative uh, fungicide. As far as application, it doesn't really get much easier. It's just single rate. So it's one ounce per thousand square feet. Um, and you know, you consider something like this, um, introducing something like this to your program and seeing if it helps, seeing if it helps. I, I think it will. It should, if you're not using fungicides already, it should make a, a pretty big difference as far as, um, keeping the disease at bay in addition to the, your cultural practices, right? Like making sure your equipment is sharp. Like that's, that's super important. It's got to stay sharp. Um, and yeah, you know, that's, uh, you know, you're, you're getting, you're getting into the kind of, um, the kind of work that's, that's involved to, you know, taking care of a green, you're getting close to those greens heights. So just the amount of work that's involved in addition to mowing just goes up. So hope that helps, sir. Uh, sorry, you're, uh, you're dealing with the disease issues. If you can't send us a picture, man, I'd like to see it. You didn't say what kind of grass you have, but cool season turf kept at quarter of an inch. I'd like to see that. That's, that's uh, that I'm sure that looks pretty sweet. So if you get a chance, send me an email. Um, my email address is ron at golfcourselawn.com. If you send it, I'll show it off here on the live stream and everyone can see the awesomeness of your cool season lawn mode at a quarter of an inch. So good stuff.
Hope that helps. All right, next up, we got Mike Harvey in the house. He says, uh, hi, Ron, what's the timing for spring fungicide treatments? Is headway still the preference? Yeah, so great question, um, Mike. So as far as spring fungicides, I like to I like to apply them in, um, like do two months in a row, the first month being May and the second being June. So um, the beginning of, of um, May, you get your your spring fungicide app, your initial fungicide app um, down, and then your and then the second one in um, in June time frame. The time when you would when you would go earlier than say May is say you have a, a history of disease in your lawn. So say maybe you get some um, some some large patch in your lawn a little bit earlier in the season. In that case, you can move your fungicide app back a bit sooner. As far as um, between headway being the preference, it really depends on you. If you prefer granular, use headway G. If you prefer liquid use um, Pillar SC. They, they are both um, excellent um, fungicides. They both are in the same family. I believe it's three and seven. It's either three and seven or three and 11. Um, I, I forget what the fungicide families are. Um, and they both have two, so they both have, um, you know, two fungicides in the single product. So if you were to go to the golf course lawn store, go to shop and the fungicide insecticide section, um, both Pillar SC and both Headway. So, um, Headway is azoxystrobin and propiconazole, and then Pillar SC is, um, I'll tell you. Um, it is, where do I have, where do I have the, let me, get, let me pull the label up, I'll tell you. Um, and that one is triticonazole and pyroclastostrobin, or clostostrobin. So they're both um, fungicides with, with, uh, with two modes of action. So really, it depends on you. If you prefer liquids, Pillar. If you prefer granular, Headway. So, um, so yeah, so hope that helps. And as far as timing goes, May and um, May, June, which you will see if you look at our um, our calendar here on the Golf Course Lawn Store. If you go to shop, to, not shop, to resources and then lawn care schedule, this is a free calendar that we put together for folks that are not in the academy but still want some guidance as far as inputs to their lawn. Um, the item five in the menu is the monthly application calendar for the schedule. And you'll see in um, in May, you have your first spring slash summer fungicide application, Pillar SC or Headway G, and then June, your second um, fungicide app, and then you are done. You're done until we get into um, into, until, into the October, November timeframe when I like to do another set of fungicide apps to help, again, keep spring dead spot um, at bay. So if you're interested in this, if you've not seen it, I um, got you covered. I'll send you a link here to where you can look at that. It's absolutely free. Um, for you guys to um, to make use of, and I'll call it here lawn care schedule. Um, so you can check that out. And you know what? Because I'm even nice, I'll even pin it as the comment in the live stream. And for those of you guys that are on the gram, you guys can check it out here too. So you guys can have it. I'm not sure if that's clickable or not, but there it is. Uh, but there you go, Mike. Hope that helps. May, June, um, October, November. That's the times when I like to do preventative fungicide apps. Uh, again, obviously, if your lawn has a history of disease a bit earlier in the season, apply your fungicide uh, sooner. It's better to prevent it than, you know, try and take care of it after the fact. So hope that uh, hope that helps. Next up, we got Mr. Mark Luna. He says, I can't wait for the revolution to arrive. It should be soon, right? It should be soon, Mark. It should be soon. They're going to be getting them in here soon. And you guys will have your shiny new toys. There's gonna to be a whole lot of this going on. Like, hey, I got my revolution. We're popping it up left and right for you guys. So uh, so yeah, you guys should be having them here um, fairly soon from what I am I'm hearing. Uh, take pictures and you know, let me know when, when you see the new hotness, when you get it. Next up is Craig Jones. He says, thank hello and thanks for all your advice. You are very, very welcome, Craig. I'm glad to be of, um, of assistance. And then next we have Vahid Navi. Vahid Navi's in the house. He says, do you think a 131313 liquid fertilizer plus micronutrients can help me maintain the lawn for the whole year? I can apply four to eight ounces per thousand square feet. Yeah, so it, I'd say Vahid, um, your soil tests will tell you whether or not you need to be um, giving the plant phosphorus or not. That's the only thing I'd say. I mean, I'm, I'm typically not too concerned if you have a fertilizer that has Obviously, you want to have something with nitrogen in it and, and a fertilizer with um, potassium. But as far as phosphorus, you really want to apply that if there's um, if there's a deficiency um, that 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 your soil test results are telling you that your soil you actually need that. 
Uh, so can it work? Let's say all oh, that's true, right? So you got you did a soil test, or you know that hey, my soil is you know my my is phosphorus deficient. Um, then yeah, that would be a great product. You can absolutely use that. Um, you can use that to maintain the lawn um, throughout the uh, throughout the season. As far as the application rates, uh, you can you can um, you know the guidance. The label should tell you hey at you know, this many ounces per thousand, you're putting this um, this much nitrogen or this much of the nutrient into the, into the plant. So you can just use that as your uh, as your guide. If it doesn't have that, I would say start low, start at the four ounces per thousand rate, and then just see how the turf responds. So spray that. Look at the turf. You know, look at the turf over the next couple of weeks. See how it looks, and you can you can start jockeying the rates, playing with going up, going down, and seeing how it um how it how it responds to that. So uh, so yeah. It looks like a nice balanced fertilizer. It's got all the macros and micronutrients. So if um, your soil tests say that that's what you need, then I would roll with it. All right, next up, we got Los in the house. He says, hey, Ron, what kind of sand do you use to level? I have Bermuda. Thanks. So what I'm a fan of using Los is a blend. So it's, um, it's, it's typically river sand or USGA grade sand. And all that really means is that sand that doesn't have a lot of trash or debris in it. Um, so I like to use a blend of 70% sand, 30% compost or topsoil. Reason being is the sand is great for adding structure. So as far as leveling out uneven parts of the lawn, sand does a great job for doing that. And then the um, the compost or topsoil is the organic component as far as um, as far as building up boiling up the uh, the quality. So it really, it really depends what you're after. Some folks top dress with 100% sand. I am a fan if you're going to go out there and do it, especially for, for residential lawns, of doing a blend of, 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 um, of a 70-30. Um, as far as what I have used in recent years and have loved the results I've gotten with, um, Super Sod makes a leveling mix that is exactly that. It's 70% USGA sand and 30% of their compost. Um, if you are in Georgia, South Carolina, Tennessee, Alabama, uh, did I say South Carolina? South Carolina and North Carolina. I think they have facilities in all of those, so you can um, you can get it from from um, from them. That is what I would use again. I've tried I've tried a bunch of different types of top dressing. Um, most of the ones that are available are in, in my area, and that stuff is by far the best because it just doesn't have the trash in it. That's that's the biggest thing. Because when you get out there and you start top dressing a lawn, right? Especially if, especially if you have a larger property. Um, um, you know, you go out there and you put the material down and if you're real mowing, you really got to get any sticks or stones or any debris and all that kind of trash off the lawn before you put the mower back on it or you're going to damage your equipment. Um, and of, of all the top dressing mixes that I that were able that I was able to buy that I've been able to test and use over the years, uh, this stuff by far has been has been the best. So if you're if you live in one of those in one of those states, I'm not sure what part of the country you're in. Um, this is what I would. Um, that's what I would roll with. And you can, using this this link, you can save, I think it's like $5 or, uh, over whatever, you know, incentives or discounts that they're currently running. To show, to show you an example of what I'm talking about, right? Normally, whenever, um, you know, I think, I've got, I think I've got this video still. Um, this is from a few years back when I used, I keep forgetting, but I think it's like six or seven bags over the, the back lawn. And as far as debris that came out of, um, seven, we'll say seven yards of top dressing mix. This was it. So if you look at that, um, this is that's a dime for reference. So over the over the space of around eight thousand square feet, like that is all that came out of seven large bags of top dressing material. Nothing else I've ever used has come close to that. I'm always picking a bunch of other garbage out of the um, out of the the, the the lawn whenever you know whenever I, I use other mixes. So big fan of the Super Sod um, product. It's not the cheapest, but it it I, it's among the best as far as like a ready made top dressing material. Um, and it has that nice blend again, seventy a nice seventy thirty blend, which I'm a I'm a fan of for for our, for residential lawns. Again, there's people that use hundred percent sand, but I'm I like a, I personally like a blend. I like to put a little bit of organic material into the soil while you're at it. So hope that helps, sir. Great question. Um, again, and hopefully you live in one of the states where you can uh, where you can get it. If not, what you can do is you can call. You should be able, in your area. You should be able to like Google, you know, top dressing my zip code or top dressing my city. Um, and if, barring that, you can call a local golf course and ask them. Like call around and say, hey, listen, I'm looking for like sand or top dressing material to level my lawn. Where, where do you guys get your stuff from or do you have any recommendations? And they're going to be, they should be able to, to point you in the right direction because they're getting it from somewhere, right? 
So that is um, that is what I would say, barring not being able to have like the stuff that I'm showing you available for uh, for top dressing. So hope that helps, Los. Um, next up is uh, Demer. Devin is up next. He says uh, he's Eric Klein. So this is in question. This is in response to the person that had is was trying to maintain the lawn at quarter of an inch. He says I'd raise your height of cut up to 0.7. Uh, three quarters of an inch or an inch. I'd say that 0.25 is too short to keep up with all that comes, um, with the issues that come with that height of cut. So yeah, so there you go. So you know what, Devin, this is a good talking point. You know, we're talking back and forth about, you know, things to discuss on the live stream next week. This can be one of them. So, you know, to folks that say, hey, I want to go super low. I want to maintain my lawn at like, you know, green side or quarter of an inch. Next week, that can be a talking point as far as you know, what goes into, into that. I, I know that, you know, a fungicide program becomes more important as you get down to those, um, those types of uh, cutting heights. But if there's anything else you can think of, and you want to share with the viewers next week, that would be um, that would be awesome. So you see what he says. This is a man that takes care of a really nice golf course for a living, and his thing is raise the height of cut up. So I didn't I didn't say that because I figured you know you would, you were going to want to do that. Um, but uh, that's that of all the things we discussed would likely be the easiest. Like a lot of the problems that you're having are going to go away if you just bump the height of cut up by um, by half an inch or so. So uh, so yeah, thanks for that, Devin. I appreciate it. Next up is JK. Uh, JK is in the house. He says, I live near you in Georgia. I put down for diamond yesterday at the 0.8 per thousand rate. It rained two or three inches today. Is it okay? Or do I need to reapply? You are just fine, JK. It's not gonna be a problem at all. Um, so you're doing a single app at the higher end of the, um, the application rate. There's no problem with that. It's what I typically do. And all the rainfall that we got is a good thing. Help water it in nice and, you know, nice and good. So you're not going to have um, no issues. I, I would not, I would not be concerned about it um, at all. So as an example, I, uh, you know, I did my pre-emergen a couple, a few couple of weeks ago at this point in um, the first part of February, you know, this, you can see what my lawn looks like right now, as far as it having a small lake out there. And that will happen a few more times throughout the season, whenever we get a lot of heavy rainfall, it just rains all day. And I don't, in that area of the lawn, it's not like I have a bunch of breakthrough from like the pre-emergent no longer being effective. So uh, I, I really wouldn't worry about it. The good thing is you got your pre-emergent out, good job. And um, it you had plenty of rainfall after you applied it, also a good thing, nothing to worry about. So um, so yeah, good stuff. I would not be concerned in uh, in the least the least about that. Most folks get really wrapped around the axle and think, you know, they get, you know, more than more than half an inch of rain that, oh no, the pre is not going to work. It's not, it's fine. It's absolutely fine. Uh, next up is Granger, the CEO lifestyle. He says, yo, Ron, when the rain stops, it's go time, my brother. Yeah, tomorrow, tomorrow, essential G is going to go down. ESG is going down tomorrow. Fair or not. That's, that's, uh, I've got, I got plenty of it already. Um, already good to go. I got my, got my season stash. So we're going to, we're going to get it going tomorrow. Uh, and then JK says some of the yard is sloped, Bermuda and Zoysia. It's still fine. Don't worry about it. Do not go out and apply more pre-emergent. So to answer your question, do you need to apply more? No, please do not do that. You've already applied 0.8 um, ounces per thousand. That's plenty. That's really, you're at the annual limit. You don't need to apply any more and it's going to be, it's going to be just fine. I'm sure your lawn does not have a big swimming pool in it like my lawn uh, did this afternoon. So you're going to be just fine. And if you don't believe me, just, just follow the lawn, follow me throughout the season. You'll see if there's any weeds in the lawn in that particular area, which if there was going to be weeds anywhere, it would be right there, right? You, um, I'll, I'll show you and you'll, you'll see for yourself if there's, um, there's not, not a problem. So the biggest thing is you got your pre-immersion applied and the timing was good and you're going to be just fine. Don't sweat it. All right. Next up is Sean Murphy, Sean Murphy, no relation to Charlie Murphy. He says, or Eddie Murphy. He says, uh, happy Friday, Ron. Mower's back from getting service. Nice. I like it. Also ordered a bag of Humic Max from the Golf Course Lawn Store this morning. It is indeed go time. Awesome, Sean. Well, first of all, thanks for the support and good job on getting your equipment taken care of. So that means that this month, because here's the thing, it's about to start, guys. You know, once we, we have, we had a cold snap today. It's a little bit chilly out there today, but it's going to start warming up here soon consistently. And the folks are going to, that have real mowers are going to be like, oh, I got to get my mower out and get it taken care of. And so Sean is already ahead of the curve. He got his equipment service. So don't, you know, don't be that guy or gal, you know, mid to late March. That's like trying to get an appointment. And they're telling you it was going to be two, three weeks out because, you know, we're now backed up because of all the work that people are asking for. Get your equipment taken care of, get it in good shape. So that you're good to go for the season. You don't have to worry about it. Good stuff. Uh, Jared George is up. He says... 
Uh, lawn is dormant for my area. I'm noticing more worm castings than I, than I previously thought were there. Can or should I do anything to flatten them out before the green up? I wouldn't worry about it. I get them on my lawn um, as well, Jared. There's not, is nothing to worry about at all. Worm castings are a good thing. It's a sign of healthy soil. Um, you don't have to do anything special. Don't try and get rid of them. Um, whenever I mow, the way what I do with worm castings, whenever I mow, the front roller knocks them down and that's how I how I deal with it. There's nothing nothing special you need to do outside of that. It's a sign of um, of healthy soil. So, congrats. And then uh, Eric is he's coming back. He says, you know, so Devin says go up to three quarters of an inch or uh, up to an inch. And Eric said shock horror. He didn't actually say that, but I'm, I can imagine he's like three quarters of an inch, an inch. No way. He's a chipping green, so <laughs> I go as low as five eighths. So, <laughs> so he says, okay, I can't, I can't do three quarters of an inch. I can't do an inch, definitely, because I mean, what we're trying to trying to go rough here. What are we doing? But I can, I might be able to. I can meet you in the middle. I might be able to go five eighths. Which again, five eighths. Believe it or not, you're going to have a lot less issues at five eighths than you are at a quarter of an inch. Because what really is is if you set the mower up for, um, if you set the the bench height up to cut at a quarter of an inch. Um, it, it likely will cut a little bit lower than that, like what the actual um, lawn is going to see. So, you know, it's you're getting the greens heights, Eric. If that's what you, if you're truly maintaining it at a quarter of an inch, that's that's getting it, and that's a that's a lot of work. I mean, if you if you do that over the summertime, uh, respect because that's there's a lot of work that goes into keeping turf looking good um, at those at those heights. I did I did just under a half an inch. I did like point point four five inches bench height a few years back. And it just about killed me because you have to be out there mowing it literally every day. I mean, you have to keep it mowing. And it's just, it's a lot of work and it, the color's not as good. doesn't stripe as well. Um, it's just a lot of headaches. So I just like now three quarters of an inch to me is the best height, in my opinion, for a residential lawn for real mowing. It's a good, nice, happy medium. All right, next up we got Mary J. What's going on, Mary? So hopefully you glad to see you stopping back in. He says, uh, the lawn is starting to show green. Yay for that. Prodiamine is down. Scalp to half an inch with a manual 16 inch reel mower waiting for the Revolution 26 to arrive and make some stripes. So another person waiting on the Revolution and nice. Now see Mary, that's very sensible as far as your scalping height. You didn't say, hey, you know, I went down to like, I got, went down to the dirt or I took it down to a, you know, a quarter of an inch or 10th of an inch, I'm going as low as I can. You said half an inch, that's a good, that's a good reasonable height, you know? And then when you get your, your Revolution and you decide you're gonna mow it say three quarters of an inch, you could be good to go. So you're not creating a bunch of extra work for yourself. And um, that's a, it's a nice reset to the lawn to start the season out. So I like it. I like it. Two Trilla is up. He says, happy Friday, Ron and Stripe Action Gang. I notice we are ahead of schedule when it comes to warmer weather, which is nice. Man, don't say, you see, you just, you just, guys look here, take a screenshot. If we get a cold snap, he's the one that jinxed it. He's the one that started this. I, I, I didn't, I wasn't going to say that because I don't want us to, you know, get here like what happened last year, third week of March, we get temps down in the, you know, freezing temps and, knocks the, you know, really, really injures the grass and, and slows things down. I don't want to say that. I want to just kind of be quiet and just kind of enjoy where things are going, but not too trilla. He's like, hey guys, we're ahead of schedule. It's going to be awesome. He says, I uh, got to throw down some humid char before mother nature stepped in. Nice, nice. You, you were ahead of me. My plan was to do essential G, uh, but that did not work out with all the, uh, the rain and other stuff going on with work and stuff. So was not able to get that done today, but tomorrow. Tomorrow. Tomorrow is another day with no mistakes. So we will uh, we will get it done then. It's me, 2017. He says, thank you for applying to my soil test. You are quite welcome. I'm going to level my yard this uh, this year, I guess. He says, but I have a negative slope. I'm afraid to fill more than one inch to level the severe dip. So you have a uh, so what I would say is this is when you are doing your leveling work, you don't have to fix it all in one go. You know what I mean? You can do your first level, you can put down, you know, half an inch of material and just see, you know, let, let the grass grow through and just kind of assess how it's looking. And then from there, in that one area where you have a dip, you can do some spot leveling there to kind of bring that area up over time. And, you know, you, you can, I guess what I'm trying to say is that you don't have to fix it all at once. You know, you can, you can, you can take a season and get um, that particular problem area a lot better than, um, than, than it currently is. A good example is like, if you look at, so between my lawn and Alex's lawn, there's an area, um, um, like my lawn, even though it looks like it's flat, which it largely is, it's a bit of a bowl. So the the, the far end slopes into the my lawn and then the area going up to Alex's lawn is also a bit of a, of a crest there. And that area, that, that 
like half pipe a section you guys don't really see it on video because it doesn't show up that well but there's there's always been or for years there were cutting issues with mowing that especially when i was mowing in the direction where the stripes are like this so when i'm mowing in like this direction i'm not sure if i went over far enough for you guys to be able to see it um i don't think i did okay but yeah i kind of i kind of did so if you look at um like the the leftmost part of the lawn even though that looks flat it really isn't there's a bit of, um, again, there's a bit of a swale there that they put in mainly because um, we can't have water from my lawn running into the neighbor's lawn. So it's kind of a bowl where all the water kind of comes in there. I say all that to say that there's cutting that in years past, there were, there were cutting issues with the mower whenever I would mow in the direction the stripes you guys are seeing now. So over the years, over many, many top dressings, I've slowly like, like recontoured that to where it's more, it's flatter, you know what I mean? So instead of being like a half pipe, it's more like the the, the curve is, is a lot more, is a lot shallower. And now I'm able to mow it without cutting problems. So I say a lot to say that you are, don't feel like you have to get it 100% the first time around. You know, you, you can do two, three top dressings in a year, is spot, you know, spot dressings in that in that area over the course of a season, and over time you'll get it a lot better to where you'll be uh, you'll be happy with it. So hope that helps. It's me, 2017. Um, good job getting the soil test done, and may you know we'll all pray for you whenever you get out there to start doing your leveling work and just have fun. Enjoy it. Enjoy the process. The lawn didn't get where it was overnight, and you're not going to fix it overnight either. So just enjoy um, enjoy the process of of getting it to where um, to where you want it. All right, next up you have John Potter. He says, hey Ron, is there any way to get rid of tall fescue out of my zoysia lawn uh, besides revolver? I just can't justify the price. It's only affecting a thousand square feet of my 10,000 square foot lawn, thanks. Yeah, so what you can do, John, is pretty much any, um, and it may take a couple of applications to do it, but um, but like a post-emergent herbicides that are safe for warm season grass. So take for example, like Certainty, or Celsius, like your zoysia will tolerate these very well. Your fescue will not. So if you had, as a matter of fact, that people that have Bermuda lawns and they oversee them with perennial ryegrass, they'll often use Celsius as a way to get rid of the of the ryegrass. Because if you think about it, it's a time of year whenever the Bermuda is coming out of dormancy and you're also trying to get rid of the ryegrass. So Celsius is a great choice of being able to get rid of the ryegrass while minimizing the chance of injuring the Bermuda. Um, so if you, but it's, but these are only for warm season turf grass. If you spray them on rye, on fescue, on Kentucky bluegrass, it will injure them. It will injure and or kill it. You know what I mean? So I would say, um, consider look into, look into, into Celsius or, um, or certainty, probably more than likely Celsius. If I had to buy only one of them, probably Celsius. Um, look into Celsius and, and use that. It may take a couple uh, rounds, make a couple applications to get to get rid of it. But again, your zoysia is going to tolerate that just fine. Celsius is a whole lot cheaper um, than than Revolver, and it's um, you know you, you're also you also can use that on on residential lawns. So it's um, so that's that's what I would I would go with. I would look at um, I would use something like like Celsius um, to to be able to control the fescue because you're also going to be able to use it for other things as well too, right? As far as like broadleaf control, it's about as good as you can get for broadleaf control in, uh, in warm season grasses as outside of Bahia grass. So hope that helps. Um, if you're looking up where you can pick up some Celsius, we carry on the golf course lawn store. And if with you only have a thousand square feet, what you're gonna wanna do is just save yourself some money. Don't go buy the 10 ounce. Like you can go grab one of these guys. So Celsius, we've got it a couple different forms. Now you can get it as a, as a single packet. So this is already pre-measured. This will spray or cover up to 2000 square feet at the high rate. Um, you've got the 10 ounce bottle, which is for several acres, and then you've got individual kits, right? So if you've got, if you just want to, like in your case, if you want to take care of the uh, of the fescue, you could do this, which is going to give you a packet of Celsius, some surfactant, and some marker dye. And given that you're only dealing with a thousand square feet, uh, this is what I would um, I would look in I would look into doing. So um, so I will send you a link to this on on the golf course lawn store. And again, the nice thing about it is that you get. You know, it's not it's not just for getting rid of of cool season grass out of warm season grass. Like Celsius has a lot of uses that are um that are great. So hope that helps. Um that is what I would use. I would not use revolver. I would go with um with one of those instead. And so I get this if I can if I can learn how to copy paste. There we go. All right, so at John Potter, and there you go. Okay, next up is uh, thank you so much, Shauna. Next up, we got Justin Judkins in 
in the house. Um, he says, hey Ron, I have a couple spots along my driveway where the lawn is lower than the driveway. Any tips on making sure not to mow concrete? Planning on cutting at half an inch with the Revolution 26. Uh, yeah, so um, you know, over time, if you want to, you can build the lawn, build the lawn up towards even. You know, even I, I actually like I prefer the, the the turf to be a little bit taller than hardscapes personally, because a couple things reasons for that. I'll answer your question, but a couple reasons why I like that is thing one, um, you don't have this problem, right? As far as the the mower, like you catching an edge with the reel um, whenever you're mowing. Um, and then also as far as like water pooling, right? Like if, if the turf is just slightly above the driveway, water tends to run off of it and onto the driveway wherever it's, where if you get the driveway here and then the lawn is down here, when water runs off, you tend to you tend to have like a spot that gets really wet and tends to stay wet. So for that reason, I like it a little bit higher. At any rate, what I would say is um, when you're mowing with the Revolution, do a trim pass. What I would say is do a trim pass um, along the driveway and then you can mow the the middle part. So how can I, I can show I can do a better job describing this. Oh, this is actually pretty good. We can use Maurice the mower as an example. Say this is your lawn, right? And this, the black frame, represents your trim pass. So we, imagine you've got like sidewalk along here and sidewalk along here. You would do your trim pass with the zero edge. So on, on real mowers, there's gonna be one side of the mower that allows you to get closer to like fence lines or in this case, a driveway than the other side. So use that side and mow along, mow a trim pass along all the way around, right? And then what you can do is um, just simply, you can finish cutting in between here going back and forth. So whereas your trim pass is mainly following any hardscapes, um, what that's gonna allow you to do is, once you've done your trim pass, you can then take the mower and kind of like um, raise the, like almost like pop a wheelie, like come off the, off the, the concrete, onto the grass and then drop it into the turf and begin your, your mowing pass. And that's gonna be a way of cutting the entire lawn while minimizing the chances of you, you know, running into any kind of concrete when you're mowing. Does that make sense? So you can do the trim pass. Um, really, if you have to pick, you can do the trim pass afterwards. I'm a fan of, of doing like the trim pass. You, know, you can use that to, as, as a cleanup cut if you want. Um, but that's how I would do it if you're trying to avoid catching an edge with the, um, with the mower with, in a case where the concrete is higher than the turf. So again, this is your lawn, trim pass around and then cut the middle out and then you're, uh, you're good to go. You shouldn't run into issues then with, um, with catching an edge because like the zero edge of the mower is literally gonna be running across or running alongside the concrete. So there's not gonna really be any chance of you, you, you having a problem by doing it that way. So hope that helps. Hopefully the way I'm explaining it makes sense to you. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and congrats on the mower that you don't have yet, but that should be coming soon. All right, so we have a super chat. Let me get one really quick here. This is from Mr. John Potter. Thank you so much, John. I really do appreciate that. Super chat received. Uh, you are very welcome, sir. Uh, yeah, hopefully that that works well for you. I mean, again, Celsius or really any selective post version herbicide should do a, should be able to to get rid of um, cool season grass out of your your warm season lawn. I mean, again, it may take a couple of rounds, but that's a that's that's how I would go about would go about doing it. All right, Long Guido has a question. He says, how can I boost my micronutrients? Uh, you can use a fertilizer with micronutrients in it. So it depends on which micronutrients you need. So for example, if you say you need a, um, you need iron and manganese and magnesium, right? So some of the granular fertilizers that we carry, so if you go to the golf course lawn store, you go to shop and then lawn fertilizer. If you look at either of these, so like the complete 147 to 14 or the stress, these, these guys both have um, the macros, but they also have some iron in them, they have some manganese in them, and they have some magnesium in them. So you've got some of your micros there. If you want a complete suite, the complete suite of micronutrients, um, you could look at so a liquid option in the form of Nutrizolve. This guy has all of them. So you've got your, um, your boron, copper, iron, molybdenum, manganese, and zinc, right? So. Depending on what you're looking for, you may go, you may end up going with a liquid. Um, but um, so two of the three Lebanon fertilizers that we carry uh, have, you know, have the, the most common micros that most people are looking for already in them. So I would say if you need phosphorus, go with the complete 14714. And if you don't need phosphorus, go with uh, the stress 12024. 
So, um, so hope that helps. Um, I'm Lon Guido and you're oh, so you asked about macronutrients. And as far as macronutrients, I've already answered the question, like any of these fertilizers, like the numbers on the bag are your macro numbers. So 16% nitrogen, 8% potassium. This has got all three of them. This has got, again, just um, more nitrogen and, and a higher a percentage of potassium. It depends on what you're, what you're looking for, what your soil test says. So I, I I'm sorry. I thought I, I thought I read I thought you asked this question earlier. I thought you were just asking again about micronutrients because I already answered the, the macronutrient one. But um, but at any rate, the answer is still the same. Find a fertilizer that addresses, that has the makeup um, to address the deficiencies in your soil based on, 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 on your soil test results. So hope that helps, sir. Um, next up is uh, Derek, uh, Derek Davis. He says, is Scott's products really uh, that good? Um, I'm down here in Houston, Texas, and I have weeds galore in my backyard. I would like to add a good topsoil and overseed to level off the yard. I have Bermuda. Um, so what products are you talking about? So it sounds like you're talking about weeds. Um, so I'm assuming you're talking about some kind of a herbicide product. I'm not familiar with a lot of their um, their post herbicide products, if they even carry any. I know they they do like some weed and feed products, so like, um, like a fertilizer and like pre-emergent. Uh, type products. I've not used used them myself to be able to tell you how well they work or or don't work. I imagine if you apply them at the correct timing per the label instructions, you should get a pretty good result. Um, and then as far as your question of topsoil to overseed and level off the yard, uh, Bermuda. So if you're going to level the lawn, I would not use strictly topsoil. I would make sure there's some sand in there. So you could do, like I'm a fan of a 70-30 blend, so 70% sand, 30% topsoil or compost. Um, you could do 50-50 if you want, but you want some sand to help add structure to, to where when you get the lawn level, it's going to stick around. You know, it's not gonna break, the sand isn't gonna break down um, or degrade like compost or topsoil uh, will with time. And the last part of your question as far as like, or your comment as far as overseeding Bermuda, I really wouldn't do that. Like unless, the only time you'd overseed Bermuda is if you are doing what Robert did where you're looking to keep your lawn green in the fall months. So say in the fall and winter months, Bermuda tends to go dormant. Um, if you, in Houston, maybe not, but I mean, in most parts of the country it does. And if you're looking to keep your lawn green year round, that's when people will overseed their Bermuda grass with say like a, a cool season grass, like perennial rye grass, annual or perennial rye, mostly mostly perennial, but some people use annual. Um, and that's what I would do. But as far as like overseeding your Bermuda grass with Bermuda grass seed, what you're gonna end up with, because there's not really any fine leaf Bermuda grass seed that I'm aware of um, available anymore, like the R15 and Princess 77 aren't, aren't a thing anymore. Um, you're going to end up with a, um, you're going to end up introducing what essentially is an improved common Bermuda, which has a thicker leaf. I mean, like visually it's, it's a, like the color is a little bit different and also the leaf texture is different and it actually, the growth rate is a little bit different too. Um, you're going to end up um, mixing that with I, what I'm assuming is a hybrid Bermuda lawn. And that's going to be create kind of a mess because you, there's not really going to be an easy way to get rid of it. So what I would say is if you're looking to get the lawn looking its best, um, the leveling work, I am all for that. Absolutely do that. Get yourself a nice blend of sand and soil, do that. And it really should not be necessary to overseed the Bermuda with more Bermuda grass seed. If the lawn is getting enough sunlight, so if it's getting enough direct sunlight and the nutrient um, levels in the soil are where they need to be, it doesn't really take a lot to get Bermuda to grow well. You know, So if you have an area of the lawn where it's just it's, it's bare, it's just not growing well, um, the first thing I would look at is, are there, is there a sunlight problem? So if you're not getting enough sunlight, that's going to be an issue. And that would be an issue regardless of whether you try to use grass seed or not. That's still, still going to be a problem. Um, the other thing you'd look at is, uh, is there any debris like plywood or anything, anything under the soil um, near the surface that's preventing the grass from doing well there? And then finally, you know, some kind of a nutrient deficiency, some kind of nutrient problem that's causing the grass to not, to not grow. If you correct that, so we check all those boxes, Plenty of direct sunlight. There's no debris or trash under the under the like, near the near the surface, um, and you've got the nutrients where they need to be. Bermuda is going to do just fine. It's going to spread throughout the entire line. It'll 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 do it'll do well. Um, if you have a bare spot that is not subject to any of those things, and you're trying to get the grass to fill in faster, 
what you can do is once the Bermuda starts growing, which in Houston it probably already is, you can take plugs, you can transfer plugs of, of the from the, the parts of the lawn that are doing well and move those into the areas that are a little bit thinner. And then that's gonna help that area fill in faster. And when it does, it's gonna all match. So what I'm trying to say is grass seed, Bermuda grass seed anyway, is not the way to fix your problem in a way that you're gonna be happy with. You know, like look at the look at like be a detective and try and figure out why but why the grass isn't growing in the first place. And then once we figure that out, um, then it's, it shouldn't be difficult to get Bermuda to, to grow well throughout the entire lawn. Again, assuming you're getting enough sunlight. So hope that helps, uh, Derek. I can't give you more guidance or advice on um, on the Scots products. Again, I don't I don't use their um, I don't use their their products to be able to tell you. Um, I, I would imagine if you read the label and apply it per the label's instructions, you should get a, a good result. So that's that's all I can um, all I can tell you. All right, um, next up, Archie says, you missed all my questions at the beginning. They may have not come through, Archie, depending on how early you asked. Can you post them again? I'll go back up and I'll look here, but um, uh, I'm, I, hopefully I didn't, hopefully I didn't miss them. Um, I, I, if, if I did, let me know. I mean, me message me and say, hey, I miss, you missed my questions and I'll, I'll go revisit them. But I know, I know you asked a bunch. Um, and here's the thing, whenever the live stream starts, even though you guys are like in the comments prior to the show starting and you're kind of chopping it up and you know, getting questions ahead of time, for whatever reason, the software that I use for the first, um, the first like 10 minutes or so of, of comments, they don't come in in order. So, so when the show first starts, if you see me answering questions out of order, it's not because I'm ignoring you. It's literally, that's just how the software re read what was already in, on YouTube and, and you know posted them for me to look at. So I think I got all your questions. If I didn't, feel free to let me know and I'll revisit it. Um, but that's, that's why that happens if you notice that, especially if you're in early and you are asking questions, you're like, hey man, you, you totally asked a guy that answers the questions, like three questions below mine, that's why. I'm not ignoring you. It's just that's um, that's what's going on. All right. Um, and then er and Devin is following up. He says, uh, Eric, that makes sense. I'd get on a good fungicide rotation then. Mm. It will help you if you can't get on it. It would also help with the general health of the plant and vigor at that height. So in other words, fungicide is going to be part of what you're doing, Eric, if you are definitely committed to the quarter of an inch mowing height. All right. Um, next up, we have a question here. This is in, on Instagram. This one's from Nathan uh, Pearson. He says, I live in Tennessee, working with common Bermuda, just put down pre-emergent. Nice. How long to wait till I scalp and when should I apply the first round of fertilizer? It's a great question. Uh, so when do you, when do you scalp? Um, I, a couple of weeks from now, if you want to, there's, there's not really a set time as to when um, you have to scalp the lawn. Whenever you start seeing a little bit of green coming in, that's a great time to go out and, and scalp it, get it all cleaned up and, and you know, set yourself up for, for success for this growing season. And then when it comes to the first round of fertilizer, um, same thing. Whenever you, you are seeing a lot, of, a lot of green throughout the lawn is when you can start introducing uh, fertilizer. That's when you're really gonna benefit from it, right? So I mean, if you applied it now, um, is it gonna hurt anything? Not really, but you're not going to get as much out of it as if you wait until the, the lawn is waking up more and it can really make use of it. So the general rule that I tell people, especially people that are in Florida, right? Because um, if the, because because in their case, some of their lawns don't really go dormant, but it slows down quite a bit how quickly it's growing. So a good litmus as far as knowing, should I be applying granular fertilizer to my lawn or not, is if you are out there mowing it. So if you're out there mowing it, say once a week, at least once a week, then you can be feeding it, you can fertilize it. If you're not mowing it, I mean, if it's green and, and you're not, you know, you're not, um, but you're not just not mowing it, then if you apply fertilizer, I, I think you're gonna get limited value out of it versus whatever the, the, the turf is actively growing, if that makes sense. So I think I got all of your questions and yeah, thanks for, for the question. If you have anything else, uh, let me know. All right, next up we have uh, Jared George, back to you two, he says, um, let me get here. He says, uh, my new to me slash free McLean 10 blade is nearly done. Plan on having a grind done in about three weeks. Still new to reels, but long time knife sharpening fanatic. Why can't I manually sharpen uh, the reel? Because you don't have the machinery to do it. 
you, it's not it's not like sharpening a knife where you get like a you can get like a stone and 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 do that you need you need like a, a proper piece of equipment like to to get the angles right um it's just not something that you can um that most people can do at home themselves it's not like a it seems like it's a knife but it's not it's not as as simple as you as you might um as you might think if you've never seen video of like a real a real being sharpened um it's actually pretty it's actually pretty fast it's fun to watch um but it takes a, a dedicated piece of equipment where they can set the angles properly and make sure that they're able to um like as part of what you're doing right is not only putting an edge on it but if the reel gets um any kind of a cone in it so what that means is one side of the reel is slightly larger even if it's only by a, a few thousandths than the other side of the reel that so the reel is not really like cylindrical anymore it's kind of like a cone shape like a grinder allows you to properly take that out and make everything squared up and true again. You couldn't do that yourself when you're with you just eyeing it. You know what I mean? So it's not something you can do yourself. You need to take it to a um, professional and let them do it. You're going to get a better result by doing that. It's not like sharpening your knife. That's what I'm trying to say. It's more, a little bit more involved. All right. Next up, we got uh, Jake uh, Wies or Weisler. He says, um, he says, uh, uh, hey, Ron, is preventative uh, fungicide a thing? Yes, it is. I know preventative insecticide is. If it is a thing, would it be more prudent to throw something like Caravan G or over just a celeprin each April stash May? Great question. So first of all, is preventative fungicide a thing? Yes, yes, it is. Um, it's a it's a great tool for preventing disease from being becoming a problem in your lawn. And as far as time time for them to do that, um, May June is when I like to do it. Um, as far as using something like Caravan, yeah, so Caravan is a good option if you're looking to do an insecticide application um, and a fungicide app. You could do Caravan in in like May time frame. Um, the thing with it, the thing with that is that Caravan doesn't control as many insects as um, a celeprin does. And as from an environmental standpoint, a celeprin is a better, is a more environmentally friendly um, insecticide than, um, than the active ingredient that's in Caravan. So I like to decouple them to where I use um, a celeprin in April and then um, either Headway or Pillar SC in May, June. Um, that that is really the best of both worlds. You're getting better fungicides by doing it that way, and you're getting a better insecticide by doing it that way. If you want to do what you're talking about, what you could do is you could do an application of Caravan in, say, like late April, early May, and then for your second fungicide app in the spring, just do Headway, because what you would not want to do is do Caravan twice in a row, because it's a fungicide and insecticide. You're going to be putting down insecticide. You're going to be doubling up on insecticide, and you really don't need to do that. So I would do... If you want to go this route, I would do um, Caravan G in late April, early May timeframe. And then for your second application, only apply a fungicide in the form of Headway G or Pillar uh, SC. So, um, so I hope that helps. It's a good question, Jake. And uh, and yes, it is It is very much a thing. Um, you know, yes. It's, it's, and, the thing, the, and the reason why it's a good idea to do a preventative fungicide, you think about the time of year. Um, it's, it's a, we have a lot of moisture um, in the in the May May time frame, and temps are starting to get starting to get um, warmer, and that's that those conditions, a lot of moisture and um, high humidity, high temps, and temps going up are a good time for for diseases like um, like large patch developing in your lawn. Like in my lawn, the only time I've ever really had disease problems have been in April and May. So it's it's that time of that time of year, and by doing preventative fungicide apps, when I started doing that, it's no, I don't really have those issues anymore. So, and when since I started, it's probably been three years now since I've been doing um, preventative fungicide apps in the fall, so like October, November, um, that is to help prevent problems like spring dead spot. Since I started doing that in the spring, I don't have wake up, you know, I don't, I don't have my lawn wake up, and I have like you know spots of the lawn that are that are dead that take like you know, weeks to recover from. So yes, preventive fungicide absolutely is a thing. Um, whenever Devin is on next week, we can chat about that too, because you think about it, like golf courses use uh, preventative fungicide apps um, like like several, like monthly on greens to help prevent disease problems from becoming a thing. So yes, it is very much just like insecticides, um, preventive insecticides are, are a thing. Preventive fungicide apps are also, are also a thing. 
Um, next up is It's Me uh, 2017. It says, what do you think of Talic uh, 7.9 for pesticide? I've never used it. I've, I've heard that it's, that it's, a, it's in, uh, a pesticide or insecticide that, that it controls a lot of stuff. I've never used it myself to be able to know um, how well it works. I've never, I've never even read the label on it to know what it's, what it's labeled to control. So I can't really, um, can't really comment um, on it. It's me 2017. I'll look into it though. I've just, I'm just not one of that that I have any direct experience with. All right. Uh, next up is Jared. He says, I see the bevel and I feel like if I, I feel like, like if I don't hear or see everyone back laughing and professionally grinding, I would have just taken my time and sharpen uh, the long curve by hand with a belt and wet and uh, and whetstone. Uh, yeah, I, I would not. I would take it to a I would take it to a professional place and have it have it done because for the the one thing you're not going to be able to see is any kind of coning that might be in the um, in the reel and a professional will take care of that. They'll get rid of all that for you. So I would not try and sharpen it yourself. I would take it to a professional. Um, and then Nathan says, uh, thanks, sir. Really enjoying the YouTube content. You are very welcome. Thank you for watching. I really do appreciate it. And then next we have Ant Live. Ant Live says, I just put down my prodiamine and certainty. I want to oversee my Bermuda this year. When is a perfect time to do this since I put down my prodiamine and certainty? It's not going to be because the time, first of all, I've already answered the question about overseeding Bermuda. If you're talking about overseeding Bermuda with Bermuda, I wouldn't do that. Um, if you're talking about overseeding Bermuda with, say, a ryegrass in the fall, you're going to be fine um, by doing your pre-emergent now. So really, you want about four months between when you do your pre-emergent app and then when you plan to do any kind of, um, of grass seed to get good germination. I mean, there's some people who say, oh, you know, I, I overseeded after doing pre-emergent and I got some to grow in. And you might, but it, you're, you're working against yourself by putting out pre-emergent and then trying to, to grow grass seed. So if your question is, can you overseed in the fall with like a cool season grass? That should be just fine. As far as in the springtime, um, one, I wouldn't do that. And then two, uh, by the fact that you already put down prodiamine, you're gonna you're gonna be working against yourself. If your question was, hey, I'm planning on doing a renovation of my lawn this year, and I'm gonna grow um, Bermuda grass from seed, the answer would have still been, don't apply pre-emergent because it's going to negatively affect your ability to to get Bermuda to grow in and and do well. So um so yeah, hope that helps. I'm um, Ant Live, and hopefully your question is really more around fall pre-emergent instead of I'm uh, sorry, fall um seeding overseeding versus doing a seeding project this spring, because that, that ship is pretty much sailed based on what you're telling me here. All right, next up is Robert Wallace, Clemson fan. You know, Robert, you know, I guess I'm giving you a hard time, because at least, at least you're not an Alabama fan, because Clemson, I mean, you know, we don't, like Georgia, we don't necessarily like, care for Clemson too much either, but y'all are better, you know, y'all are better than, than um, folks in Alabama, you know, I'm just saying. He says, happy Friday, Ron. Thanks for the advice on the Alec mower. I should be picking it up on a couple of weeks. Cool, nice, man. Let me know how that works out for you. Very, very cool. And then um, No Name says, side note, F1 is back too, baby. Yes, I know. I was watching uh, qualifying today. So um, no surprise, Verstappen is the fastest. But I'll tell you, the Ferrari boys, man, they might might bring it. You know, they um, it's not, I mean, Perez is not, he's kind of hit or miss whatever he's going to do. But I mean, it's, it's it looks like it could be an interesting season to where it's just not going to be just the Red Bull show all year. I would hope not. I mean, I, it'd be nice to have it be somewhat competitive. Um, but yeah, looking forward to it. Tomorrow, I think it's gonna the race is gonna is a Saturday race instead of usually on Sunday. So yeah, qualifying's done. Uh, from what I remember, I think Max Max is in first, and I forget who's um, who's second. But um, yeah, I know Max is first. And I know that Mercedes. I'm what's his face? Russell has got third place. I forget who's in second place. So yeah, good times. F1 is back, right? Good times. And then uh, next up is Derek Davis. He says, also, what's good to put out for yard pests? Depends on the kind of yard pest you're dealing with. If you're talking about like uh, lawn damaging insects like grubs, then I am a big fan of an insecticide called acelaprin. Nice thing about this is it takes care of your grubs and your bluegrass weevils, bill bugs, it also takes care of army worms. So as far as like an insecticide to rule them all, um, it's really tough to do much better than acelaprin. Um, and the nice thing about it, the the active ingredient that's in this, Derek, is um, it's also the least bad for for pollinators like um, like uh, like bees. And then if you deal, you think about like uh, like um, earthworms and invertebrates that are are, are good for our soil. Um, Acelaprin, the the active ingredient in it, uh, chlorantranilprol, is 
um, also is also a good choice for that. So as far as like an environmentally conscious insecticide to use, it's um, this is what this is what I would go with. In the past, I used to use Caravan many years ago, and then I switched to a Celeprin in recent years, and I haven't I haven't looked back. So this is this is what I would roll with as far as lawn damaging insects. If you're asking about how to control like roaches, mosquitoes, gnats, like the kind of bugs that make things um, irritating for us uh, and ruin our enjoyment in the lawn, what I would go with is, um, do I have a bottle of it? I do. I would go with this. This is um, the non-toxic pest control by Miramichi Green. This takes care of, I'll tell you, it does mosquitoes, ants, noceums, roaches, ticks, aphids, white flies, fleas, and chinch bugs. And um, again, the nice thing about this is it's a non, non-toxic product. So the cool thing is, let's say you had family coming over tomorrow and you were gonna be out on the porch and you guys wanted to enjoy to your time on the porch without having, or on the patio, without having like mosquitoes eating you up. You literally could spray this over, you could spray the entire patio with it. Um, once it dries, you can re-enter the area. I mean, it smells nice. It smells kind of like, um, has like a like a citrus, like a lemon citrus scent to it. So it's a great smelling product um, and works works really well. And then you get a about a three week residual, three weeks of control out of this product. So if you're looking for a non-toxic, approach to, again, fleas, gnats, mosquitoes, those types of things, um, the Miramichi uh, pest control. And if you're looking for lawn damaging insects, I would say uh, a Celeprin. You can get both of them um, under the insecticide section. So if you go to the golf course lawn store, go to shop and then insecticide and fungicide, you'll see a Celeprin available in both uh, granular form and as a suspension concentrate. So it depends on whether you like liquid or granular. And then the Miramichi pest control is available here. So this is, you know, as far as um, keeping bugs away, uh, this is uh, the section that I will, I'll point you to. So here you go, Derek. Hopefully this helps, sir. And um, let me know if you need anything else. All right, so we have another super chat. Uh, let me... Let me get this um, going for you. We got this one from Fernando I, I think. Super chat received. He says, um, hey Ron, following the calendar this week, should I apply this, the 12-024? In my case, based on soil tests, the product is um, the Lemon Fertilizer. Should I apply this? Uh, yeah, so Fernando, if, if I remember, I, I believe you're in Florida, right? And I think we've corresponded um, before in the past. If you, if you are mowing your lawn, so if you're out there and you're regularly mowing your lawn, say once a week, then yes, absolutely. You know, per the calendar, if you want to, you want to put that out along with um, essential G, like your, your granular biosimilant, I'm a, I'm a big fan of doing that. So to answer your question, yes, I believe you are in Florida if I, if memory serves me. And if you're mowing your grass, then yes, by all means, that's that's the fertilizer that I would start the uh, start the season out with. So. Good question. Thank you so much for the super chat. I really do appreciate all the love and support. If you need anything else, uh, definitely let me know. Let me know. All right, now the fun part, figuring out where I left off. Oh, Tyler, Tyler Die says, um, hope you're feeling good, Ron. I am, I am, I've been, I'm, I'm doing all right. Getting there, can't, can't complain too much. And if I did, no one would listen, right? You guys might, but you know, most people wouldn't care. They'd be like, oh, well, that really stinks that you're dealing with that. But then they just go on with their lives, right? So I, don't, I try not to complain too much. Uh, Mike Harvey is up next. He says, <laughs> this is good. He says, I mathed wrong on my Prodiamine app and ended up applying 0. 0.6 per thousand instead of 0. 0.8 per thousand. Can I do a second application for the difference? 0.2 per thousand to get the max rate or would there be no benefit? Yeah, you can, if you if you want to, you can absolutely do that. Uh, if you're going to, Mike, I would say wait till April, April timeframe to do it. And yeah, yeah, that would, that would be fine. Most people do, they cut it in half. They'll do like a 0.4 and then a 0.4 as far as for warm season grass. Uh, but if you did 0.6 because you were mathing wrong and you want to do your second app, you know, a month or two from now, that would be, uh, that'd be absolutely fine. You're still going to get, um, you're still going to get benefit from it. It's a good, it's a good question. It's a good thing you caught your math mistake, right? Nothing, nothing like math and wrong. Cause I'm telling you math and wrong when it comes to pre-emergent or any kind of insecticide or fun or fun, you know, just in general, anything you're applying can, uh, can result in an ouchie. So we're, I'm glad that you math, your math was, was incorrect in a way that was on the right side. In other words, if you're going to make a mistake, like un being a little bit low on the rate is better than being over. So you got to mess it up. That's how, um, that's the way to do it. Uh, next up is Douglas Samuel. He says, what do you think about speed zone? It's a, I think it's a good uh, a herbicide. The thing, the thing with um, speed zone that I, I am not a, a huge fan of is that it, um, you, you got to be careful with temperature. 
Uh, there's different types of speed zones, but I'm assuming you're asking about um, speed zone for that you can use on warm season turf. Um, it's um, like a great combination is if you and if you don't care about the grass turning yellow, like dismiss and speed zone, relatively inexpensive combination, cleans up a lot of weeds, but it's gonna yellow the lawn. You know, and most people, what you find, Douglas, is most people will say, oh yeah, I'm fine with it, it's good. If as long as it kills the weeds, I really don't care. But as soon as the, the lawn starts getting discolored and you start seeing yellow in there, um, most people don't, um, don't have the fortitude that they think they do. In other words, they want the weeds gone and they don't want the grass to change color, which is why I recommend Celsius um, for broadleaf control and then certainty for um, for sedge control. But again, speed zone's a good, it's a good herbicide. It's just not one, it's just one you gotta be more careful with because it is, while it's gonna control the weeds, it um, the chances of you having uh, discoloration, especially as temps get higher, is is quite a bit more so than what you're gonna see with uh, with Celsius or certainty, which is why, again, I don't recommend it because most people would, and I don't, I don't want people to go out and spray that stuff on their lawn and then it get discolored. They'd be like, oh man, I sprayed this stuff on my lawn. My lawn's all yellow now. And I'll be like, yeah, that's kind of what's going to happen. Um, which is partly why Celsius costs what it costs and why certainty costs what they cost because you can spray it over a broad temperature range and it kills the weeds and it doesn't damage your grass if as long as you stick within the, the correct rate. So that's why well, that's why I like it more. You get, you get what you pay for when it comes to, um, like most things in life, but definitely when it comes to herbicides. Uh, Andre Taylor. Andre Taylor is up next. He says, evening, Ron. Happy Friday. And thanks as always for the great content. Any suggestions on comfortable knee-high lawn garden shoes? Knee-high. I don't I don't wear any knee-high gardening shoes. I mean, I have boots. I have boots that I use whenever I spray um, liquids on the lawn. And I just got those from big box store. Like they're like $15 or whatever they were. I bought them a couple years ago or several years ago at this point. Um, but I don't have anything else. Like I, I mow the grass in um, what I what do I wear? I have like um, to like dad shoes. I think they're like uh, the the Monarchs. I think the Nike Monarchs. That's what I that's what I roll with. Um, so that's uh, that's what I cut the grass with. And when I'm out in the lawn, if I'm not spraying, uh, that's what I'm wearing in the lawn. I don't have if if you're looking for like general use knee highs, I don't have anything for you on that. For me, I just again I roll with the with the Nike. The Nike Monarchs. So, um, so there's that. And what's what's the other popular one? I think I think New Balance also makes a shoe that's like the official dad lawn, like the actual lawn shoe. But I don't I don't have any of those. I got I, I roll with the uh, the Nikes. So uh, so yeah. Sorry, Andre. Um, if you're looking for like boots for just spraying, though, you can go to any any big box store or Amazon and just get yourself a set, and they'll last they'll last you a really long time. That's that's what I do. All right. Next up is Justin uh, Judkins. Uh, it says, how much release 901C do you add into your bi-weekly primo applications? Do you calculate this into your monthly N amount? If so, how much? Thanks for your help. Great question, Justin. Yes, I do. So I spray 901C every two weeks along with Primo, NutriKelp, Biospectrum, and Nutrizolve. So that's the stack that I that I spray. Um, the It works out to about a tenth of a pound of nitrogen um, per app, or the equivalent of about a tenth of a pound of nitrogen per application. Um, so between my granular app and the two liquid sprays that I do in a month, I get around seven tenths of a pound, between seven tenths to eight tenths of a pound of nitrogen. Um, and that that works well on my line. It it, um, it responds well to that. So I uh, so hope that helps. Yeah, so about, so the total amount of nitrogen that I put in the lawn from liquids is two tenths of a pound, thereabouts, between the two sprays. And then the granular that goes into the lawn is about half a pound. That comes from, from, a, um, from Humic Max at three pounds per thousand. So uh, good stuff, thanks for the question. And if you are interested in like the rates that I use to be able to pull that off, um, check out the the blog on um, on spoon feeding on the golf course lawn store that talks that talks all about that. Like why spoon feeding is awesome, and why I'm a huge fan of it, and why you should do it if you have if you're a serious lawn care nerd and you have the time to do it. Um, let me see if I can find it. Here you go. Yep. So this one right here. Uh, what? What, why you should start spoon feeding your lawn. So it talks about, shows my lawn. This is a picture from the, of the lawn actually from last year. And it shows the, the granular fertilizer that I use, the liquid fertilizer that I use. I talk about why I use this combination. I give like spreader settings for, for Humic Max. I give um, app, uh, settings for, or sorry, um, uh, rates for release 901C and then tips for getting, you know, rainfall around rainfall and this kind of thing for getting a good result. So, uh, so yeah, if you're looking for like, you know, how I, like how Ron sprays his lawn and the rationale behind it and the results, this uh, this blog post will 
get you um get you all squared away. Let's see here at uh, Justin Judkins and then Spoon <sighs> Feeding Log. There we go. Go. All right. Good. Good stuff. So yes, hopefully that helps, Justin. Uh, let me know if you need anything else. Uh, Douglas Samuel says, "Go." Do See now, now that's an appropriate comment. And now, 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 Douglas, um, we got to balance it out because if we're gonna say "Go Dogs," although this is like you know more like Georgia territory, we don't want to encourage the folks from you know the neighboring our neighboring state to the to the west who you know got no no behavior. You know, it's funny. Did you guys ever see that? Not there's a kind of a sidebar. Do you guys ever see that? Um, it's a classic. The guy, he's like an Alabama fan, and he's talking about the volunteers, like the Tennessee volunteers. It's, it's, it's hilarious. You get to see it. You got, I, I guess if I can find it sometime in sense, you guys, where he compares, uh, what is it? Like, is this, it's, like, it's, like a, it's like a garbage truck convention. And it, I mean, it's, it was like, it was the most savage roast as far as like one college team to another. If you got to, if you ever find it, you got to, um, you got to look it up. It's, it's, it's actually pretty good. All right. And then Mark Luna, um, hook em horn. Is it like a Texas thing? Oh, man. This is just. You guys, no behavior. All right, next up, back to back to long here. Um, Crystal uh, Manigault says, "Hey Ron, had a lot of rain today. Is it okay to collect soil samples?" Uh, yeah, you can. If, if you would go out there, it's where it's safe for you to be on the lawn. You can still collect your samples. I mean, it's not gonna it's not gonna really affect the results um, from from the um, that you're gonna see for, for the my soil test. So um, I typically will don't like I would not go out today and go do it because it's raining outside. It's kind of a mess. Um, it's kind of a soggy mess, um, but if you wanted to collect samples tomorrow morning when the rain has stopped and it'd be it'd actually be pleasant to be outside doing it, there'd be no problem whatsoever for doing that at all, um, Crystal. None whatsoever. No problem at all. All right. Uh, next up is Colin. He says, yep, I'm in Cali. Uh, I wasn't trying to make you jealous. He was trying to make us jealous. You guys, you, you know, here's the thing, man. I, we all know, we all know a flex when we hear a flex. Kind of like the guy that came in and says, hey, you know, I've got my cool season grass that I may, I, I mow it like, at like, hang on, I got to, I got my cool season grass that I mow it like a quarter of an inch because that's what real men do. You know, a quarter of an inch, half an inch and three quarters of an inch is for you lesser humans. We know a flex when we hear it. And when folks are like, oh, you know, my grass is green and it's dormant. Check out my, dorm, my dormant grass. It's also, also like that. You know, it's like also Robert, whenever he shows picture, I mean, do we have a picture of Robert's lawn? Yeah, when, pa when Robert, you know, sends a picture of his lawn, like during the growing season, and he's like, he's like, hey man, I don't, you know, is it look to you guys, but if you look at the green closer to the camera, does that green seem like the same color as the green, like two stripes over? I think I might have like a nutrient problem or an iron problem. It's just, a, it's a subtle flex. That's, that's all it is, so. You may not realize it, Colin, but that's that's we all we all know what's going on. It's okay. It's all right. Make your lawn your lawn's green when all of ours are dormant. You reserve that right. He says, I figured you guys and others would like to see what Pasolum could look like when it's in its dormant phase. I mean, that is that's not what I would really consider dormant grass. Like <laughs> Bermuda, like what what I got out back, that's dormant grass. I would I would take what you got. All right. Uh next up is Alex. Um he's saying. You are saying it correct. I've been meant to say something because I was so impressed. Alec, uh, now I'm going to bush now. Ristano, Ristano, Ristano. Okay, well, I'm, I'm glad I'm saying it right. Whenever, whatever I just, what just pops in my mind, whenever I, when I see your name, I'm saying it correctly. I'll just stick with that. So I appreciate it. All right, next up is Jason Harrison. He says, Mike, I put down pillar yesterday. Uh, last year I got ravaged, so I'm dropping the extra treatment to get out in front of it. Yeah, so that's a good point, uh, Jason. If you have, like I said, the, the, from a preventative standpoint, um, I find that May, June, and then again, October, November are the timeframes that work well for me. And it's also worked for well for other people that um, have followed that based on um, what I teach in the Golf Horse Lawn Academy. If your lawn has a history of disease earlier in the season, you should apply fungicide ahead of that. Like you want to you get ahead of it. You don't want there to be a problem and then try and correct it after the fact. You want to prevent it. Like kind of like, like insect damage, and lawn disease is better to prevent them than have to deal with them after the fact. So then Jason says, I'll do pillar, then clearies, then pillar, um, March, April, and May. So you've had a, I guess you've had an issue, a problem. So you're just trying to not have an issue. I, I hear you. And, and what, and what Jason is showing there is, is important. So as far as fungicide, this is a good point, good talking point. As far as, um, fungicides, I don't like to apply, I like to do more than two, um, two applications in a row of fungicides in the same family. So pillar is, again, it's either it's either three and 11 or three and seven. I forget which family it is. One of them is three anyway. Um, so 
pillar, if you're doing that, say, like say he did one now, and he did one in March, then rotating to Clary's to 336F, which I believe is a group one, um, would be the way to go. Because that way you, you, you get away from, if you keep saying applying the same fungicides over and over and over again, you can begin to have dis, uh, resistance problems. Um, so to avoid that, you know, two apps of the same one and then rotate away to something else. And then if you want to come back, that would be okay. But I mean, you don't want to just keep hitting, using the same fungicide over and over and over and over again. Um, especially if you're gonna do it, like I said, two times in a row would be okay, but much more than that, you really wanna look at rotating to something else um, to prevent the chance of, um, reduce the chance anyway of, of resistance problems, which is what Jason is doing. All right, uh, Oliver Rittum is back. He says, Ron, last season, when you were applying the Mirichi 444 in the front and Humic Max in the back, did you notice anything interesting, noticeable difference? Uh, yes, so the color response, so the, the Humic Max, um, the lawn in the back responded faster than in the front. Um, Color-wise, like once, if you if you waited up this way, like say five days after applying Humic Max, you could you would see a difference. With the triple four, it was more like almost maybe almost two weeks. For the, I'm not I'm talking about the initial app. Like once the season got going, there really wasn't any difference at all between them because it never. I, I just kept like reapplying every month. But I'm talking about the beginning, like when you first start the initial app of the season. The the lawn responded faster to Humic Max than it did to the Triple Four, which makes sense because one of them is synthetic. It's got fat. It's got um you know fast a fast release estrogen component in it, and the other one is organic. So it's just it's going to be slower as far as how quickly the um. It, it gets in the soil and it breaks down and, and the plant's able to make use of it. So uh, so yeah, I mean, outside of that, they they both worked great. The front lawn got the triple four all season. The back lawn got Humic Max um, for the majority of the season outside of the beginning and the end with, I, I used the 12 0 And the biggest difference is, is the was the start. Um, the, the, four, the triple four took longer to ramp up, but then once it did, you were, you're absolutely fine. So yeah, it just depends. If you want an organic, if you want to go like truly organic, as far as your granular fertilizer goes, then the um, the Miramichi Triple uh, Four. Uh, I'll show you real quick. This guy is a great is a great choice because some people want that. They want like you know they want a more of an organic approach to lawn care. Uh, this is your jam. So you comes in got a few bags of forty five pound bags left, and then it's only going to be just the fifty pounds available. So you've got um, either one of these. Um, the the fifty pound bag covers eight thousand square feet, whereas like Humic Max. Um, this bag, the 45 pound bag covers uh, 15,000 square feet. So, so yeah, that, that's, that's the biggest difference that I saw, Oliver. It was more whenever, more from the initial app of the season. And once, once you, once you got going, there really, there really wasn't a whole lot in it because uh, from a liquid standpoint, they both got the same liquids. So it was 901C, um, the 901C carbon kit on both front and back. And they both got Primo, um, you know, front and back. So, uh, so Yeah. Great product, I like it. Um, again, and if you want an organic fertilizer, it's a great, it's a great option. Again, Omri listed, truly organic product. So, good question. Uh, let's see here. Next, um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Um, next up is Tillman Walters. He has a question. He says, "Do I need to spray every month with certainty to keep the sedges down?" Uh, I don't, Tillman. Um, what I tend to find is if I can wait until they are they are growing, um, like they've, they've grown in well, so typically I'll spray for sedges. Like I get sedges in two areas of my lawn, between um, Alex's lawn and my lawn, where the water drains, like where water always passes whenever like that that big lake that's in the back lawn where that water uh, passes through. I'll get some sedges there, and also get sedges like a clump of sedges on the back of the lawn that you guys never really see between my neighbor and my lawn. Um, I find that spraying that in like a late May time frame, I'm able to do that, and that does that does a good job um, knocking it out. I don't have to spray. No, to answer your question, no, you, I don't spray monthly uh, to control sedges in my lawn. As long as you use certainty, you use surfactant with it, you do a good job um, as far as coverage, that should produce a produce a really good result. Like sedges are not terribly difficult to control if you um if you spray certainty at the right rates with uh, with surfactant. So hope that helps. Um, again, no. Monthly, you really, you really shouldn't have to. I don't have to. I don't have to, and and I haven't had any of my any viewers, anyone come back to me and say, yeah, hey, man, I'm having to spray this stuff every um every single month. You really shouldn't have to uh shouldn't have to do that. Shouldn't be necessary. 
Uh, next up is Will Addington. He says, Spectacle Flow versus Spectacle G, your thoughts? I've never used the granular version of Spectacle to know. I imagine it would work fine. I imagine it would work, it would work just fine. I, I, I can't, I can't, I've never compared the two, but I imagine it would work just fine. Kind of like if you ask me your thoughts, Headway G versus Pillar SC, uh, they both work fine. You know, if you apply them at the right time and correct rates, you get a you get a good result. I would imagine that Spectacle G would work as well as Spectacle Flow. I imagine you're going to pay more per application, so more per thousand square feet with a granular product than you are with um, with the liquid. But outside of that, I would expect you to get a good result with either of them. If you again, if you plan properly, water them in, I expect you to get a good result. Uh, Gavin Moore is up next. He says, hey, Ron, I have 1,700 square feet for a seating project, and the temperatures are supposed to be in the 60s or low 70s next week. Should I start this project or wait? Thank you for your help. So if you're talking about 60s and 70s, if that's air temperature, that's still a bit too cool. Um, I'm, assuming, I'm assuming you're talking about like warm season grass. I don't know what kind of grass you're talking about. Um, but the, the, the best way to answer your question, Gavin, is whatever grass seed you are using, on that on the bag, there should there will be um, guidance saying you want soil temperatures to be in this range to get a good results as far as germination goes, um, and then you can get a soil thermometer and check yourself, or you can use like one of the tools like Syngenta makes a tool, uh, the Greencast tool that will tell you the average five day soil temp in your area, or if you have a soil test from My Soil, they will also tell you what the five day the average five day soil temp is in your area. And if that matches up with what the guidance is on the bag, then you are good to go as far as your seeding project goes. So, um, so yeah, uh, check the label and check the soil temps. And if those are, they both are, are copacetic, they're, they're both where they need to be then, or the soil temps are where the, the, the label says they need to be to get good germination, then you can start your seeding project. If not, then you just gonna have, you have to wait a little bit longer. So, um, and again, I don't know what kind of grass you're, what kind of grass you are talking about. So it's hard to tell you. I know with Bermuda grass seed, six or like, it's, I'll say with, I know with Arden 15 or Princess 77, 65 degree soil temps is what is, is what's recommended um, for planting that grass seed and getting good germination. And in my part of the country, that equates to like late April, early May timeframe. So if that's what you're looking to do, like a renovation from, of, of a Bermuda lawn and you're going to grow it from grass seed, I try to encourage you not to do that. But if you want to go do that, it's going to likely be too early this time of year. If it's a cool season lawn, maybe not. But again, the label will tell you based on your, um, on your, uh, on your, on your soil temps. And based on that, you can, you can determine whether it's time to do it or not. All right. We got Jackie Bickley says new viewer. What's going on, Jackie? Thanks for coming to hang out. I appreciate you. Always like to have new viewers. Hopefully you're getting some value out of the content. If if not, hopefully at least it's entertaining. You know, we got a bunch of football fans in here that don't know how to behave. So if you like to hear people go back and forth about which team's the best, you know, outside of Georgia, um, then, uh, then yeah, you're going to enjoy that. If you like some Formula One talk every now and then, then you'll enjoy that. So hopefully you're getting some value out of it. I appreciate you joining the, uh, the live stream. Uh, next up, okay, we have a question here from Psalms um, 4610. It says, what is the best soil test? I wouldn't necessarily there to say there is a best. Um, I can tell you the one that I like. Um, I, I like the one from, from my soil. Reason being is that it's they're, they're easy to use. The results are easy for a person that is not like a lawn care expert to understand and interpret. And um, from a standpoint of being able to measure uh, how how like directionally your soil is is changing, they make it easy to do that. So, you know, if you, you take a soil test sample with this and say now, and then you would do another sample in the fall, all your soil test results are all saved in their portal and you're able to do a comparison between how the soil was in the spring. And then, you know, you're also able to see the effectiveness of the inputs you did in the fall because you're literally able to overlay them and measure like, you know, soil tests against against each other. Um, when it comes to soil tests, really, the thing I, I would I tell people is that while I like the my soil test kits, the 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 best thing I best guidance I would tell you to do is to pick one, like pick one and stick with it. So if you're gonna go to an, ex, an extension office, like like find the extension office you're gonna use and keep using the same one because that way you're comparing um, apples to apples to oranges, apples to apples, right? Um, what you'll find is if you use 
if you say you get like a, a, a sample or do like a, a soil test with, with my soil and you go out and you get a soil test from like an extension office, what you'll tend to find is that the overall curve will tend to match. I mean, in some cases they, they'll match really well, but in some cases the, the, um, the, the numbers may be slightly different, but the curves tend to match. The, a, a good example of what I also tell, uh, what, that I use that not everyone's gonna be able to relate to is if you're into um, like cars, right? Like if you're into like tuning cars, like a tool that is used for measuring um, horsepower, like real world horsepower in a car is a chassis dyno, right? And there's a couple of different companies that make them. Um, like some of the most common ones in the United States are um, like Mustang dynos and dyno jets, right? So dyno jet is like an inertia dyno and a Mustang dyno is like a load bearing dyno, right? So it's a way of looking at it. So they both are measuring horsepower. They're both measuring torque. But if you look at, if you ask any like, um, like, car person, they'll call the Mustang dyno like a heartbreaker dyno because it tends to read lower as far as the horsepower and torque numbers than what a dyno, like an inertia dyno, like a dyno jet does. The curves still match, meaning like if you're making peak, you know, torque at this RPM, that will be, that will be the same on both, a, on a, it tends to be the same anyway on a, on a, on a dyno jet and a Mustang dyno, but the actual numbers don't match up. So if you're trying to compare, so that's what, so it's a good example of, of how I would say um, when it comes to soil tests, like if you're going to pick, if you're going to pick like a laboratory, like let that be your dyno and stick with that one, like pick one and just stick with it. So that way, whenever you compare results from like the spring and then from the fall, you're comparing apples to apples. Um, again, if you have no preference, I prefer the one from my soil because they're really easy to, uh, to use, easy to understand. You get a recommendation um, along with your soil test results, as far as how to fix the problems that you're that you have in the soil, um, and they they work they work great. You know, I, this is what I use. Tons of people, like you know, thousands of people, use them, and they 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 get great results. They they, they get they get um, they get great lawns following the guidance that the soil test results provide. So um, so hope that helps. Um, as far as any best, the one that I like is this one. But the biggest thing I tell you is just to pick pick one and stick with it. Don't like don't like you know do this laboratory with one extraction method um, one time and do another laboratory with a different one one time and do a MISO the other time because you're going to be, you're going to drive yourself crazy. And it's really difficult to have data that, that is, that is, um, that's useful as far as comparing how the soil is one time to another time. So hope that helps. Um, if you need anything else, let me know. But again, if you ask me which one I would use, I would get the one um, from my soil. Okay. Uh, um, Am Hump um, 1969 is up next. He says, Ron, I'm in Byron, um, Arkansas, and took your advice and did a soil test. Good, I like it. Um, since I'm in Arkansas, I took your advice and got a soil test and did my split test uh, to start my start the season. Oh, I think you did soil test. I did my soil test to start the season. One for the front and one for the backyard by themselves. That's not a bad way to go because you know, if, especially if it's the first time and you've never done one. If you want to, if you have reason to believe there's a big difference in nutrient deficiency between the front and back lawn, doing individual tests are a good way to do that. And then once you go through and you correct them, you might be able to then transition to just one test for both the front and back. But I mean, what you're doing is not a um, not a a bad a bad way to um to to go. So the big thing I would tell you again is what you did is like pick one and stick with it. You know what I mean? Like pick like you know, people literally you would think it's like you're talking about you know a matter of religion when it comes to like which soil test is best. And the big thing is man, they're all tools. It's a tool for measuring nutrient in the soil. And if you're gonna do more than one to where you want to measure the effectiveness of it, kind of like a car, you want to, you know, you want to up the boost on your turbocharger, you want to, you know, put some, you know, put a new exhaust on and measure the effectiveness of it. It's not great to go and do your baseline pulls on a, on a, on a dyno jet and then go do all the modifications and then go do your, your after on a Mustang dyno. It's kind of, you're not going to get good, good data. So, uh, so hope that helps. Good job as far as um, getting your soil test done. And uh, if I can help with anything else, let me know. All right, next up we have John Rob Will. John Rob Will is up next. He says, what's up, Ron and fellow lawn enthusiasts? Just dropping by to say hello. Hello, John, Rob, and Will. Uh, and then he says, um, M Hump is back. He says, I'm kind of new to lawn care. I took your advice, so I did a soil test on the front yard by itself in the backyard. Um, not sure how to read and learn from the results. So yeah, if you want, um, he says, sorry, Ron, just want some advice. Yeah, no problem at all. So what you can do, um, M Hump, if you want, you can email them to me. My email address is ron at golfcourselawn.com. So take 
take a, if you can, a screenshot is best, but if you, if you, it's like a, if you got a soil test from like a lab or something, take a good clear picture of it from both the front and back and email that to me here, ron at golfcoursalon.com, and I will look at it and I will tell you, hey, this is what I would do based on what I am seeing in the um, in the soil test data. So yeah, no, no worries at all. You got the soil test done. I'm more than happy to take, take a few minutes and um, look over them and, and let you know what I think. So good stuff. Good job, man. Good job. Good, 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 good job. All right, next up is Matthew um, Burgi. Matthew Burgi, he says, um, I have a zoysia lawn and I live in North Carolina. I usually cut my grass between half an inch and three quarters of an inch with a manual reel mower. I've noticed my lawn has gotten very stemmy, wondering if scalping to the dirt would help. I think scalping would help. I don't know if taking it to the dirt is truly necessary, uh, Matthew. Can you do it? Yes, like sometimes whenever, you know, Lee from Real Rollers, whenever he's, you know, scalping the turf part, because that, that, that you, you want to see some turf grass that gets abused because it gets cut all the time. You know, people come out testing out mowers and stuff and um, it, it gets beat up quite a bit. And like last year when he scalped the zoysia, I mean, he took it to the dirt. It was like, you could tell there was some grass there, but it was pretty much mainly dirt. Uh, so, which is kind of handy when you have a bunch of real mowers at your disposal and you don't really, you know, care if you have to send it out for sharpening. But at any rate, if you're asking me if it's going to, like, is the zoysia going to recover from it? Yes. Um, but you, you really shouldn't have to do that. So if you can get it down, you said between half an inch, if you can get it down under half an inch, you know, which is getting close to getting to the dirt, um, if you get down under half an inch, that should be, that should be enough to have the lawn grow back through and be, and be in, in, a, in a better in a better place. Um, you're gonna have a challenge scalping it to the dirt with a manual reel mower anyway. You know, it's gonna be tough to do with a manual reel mower. You're gonna need a power one. If you decide to go that route, you're gonna need a power drill mower to be able to do it effectively. So there's something else to consider. I mean, again, the lawn will recover from it. Um, I just think it's a lot of work and it's pretty hard on equipment to go that route. So it's up to you, Matthew. Um, I would I would stand by, you know, go a quarter to half an inch below the height of cuts you intend to maintain the lawn at. And given where you are, you're probably gonna have to get your hands on a, on a powered reel mower to be able to, uh, to pull that off. Okay, next up is Bruce Romano. He is in the house. He says, hey Ron, I have spotted the dreaded common Bermuda growing in my tiff way in a few spots. We all got some of that, man. He says, is there a way to get rid of this other than hand removal? Planning to dethatch the end of March, thanks for your help. Not really. There's not really a way to selectively remove common from a hybrid. And even if you hand pull it, it's probably gonna come back. It's gonna come back, probably. It's gonna come back. Like, good luck getting rid of Bermuda grass. Here's what I can tell you is a, is a way to where it will, it will stand out less. So um, if you use growth regulator, if you use Primo regularly, so like you you start, not now, it's too early, um, unless you're somewhere your lawn is already green. Like maybe if you're in California, you can get away with it. But if you um, if you start using Primo, like a growth regulator, and you spray every couple of weeks, um, what that's going to do is it's going to even out the growth. It's going to it's going to slow down the um, the rate at which the common grows to where it's not going to be as apparent. You're not going to you're not going to see it as as much as if you just kind of let it let it do its thing. Um, you're not to answer your question. There's not really um, a way to selectively truly get rid of it um, permanently. I mean, you can try, you can pull it, but it's going to come back. You, I, I, I'll just tell you that much. Um, what I've seen works well that I've actually done myself is using growth regulator. Like if you if you keep growth regulator in the, in the lawn, in the plant, it's a lot harder to, to the, the, the difference between the common and the hybrid are not going to be quite as apparent if you do that versus if you just allow them both to grow as they, um, as they want to. So sorry you're dealing with that. Um, if you're not using growth regulator, consider using Primo, great product. And it's, you know, that's one of the benefits of, um, of, of the product. So, um, I would, I would consider that dethatching is not really going to do anything again for the common. It's again, it's not, it's once Bermuda, what's common Bermuda is in your lawn. It's tough to get rid of, you know, so, um, sorry, I don't have a better answer for you. I mean, you can, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's the best, best guidance I can give you without taking like drastic measures. I mean, if you really wanted to try, if you had like one area, one spot, and you didn't care if the lawn looked ugly for a while, what you could do is you could take like, um, you say glyphosate and fusillade, you can mix those two and you could spray the common Bermuda. It's gonna kill the common. It's also gonna kill any surrounding hybrid Bermuda. Once it's gone, um, three weeks or so later, and again, you're gonna have a big dead spot in your lawn which could look pretty ugly. What you could then do is you could transfer plugs from 
the parts of your lawn um, that are, are still doing well, that don't have any common in it into that area that you just killed off. And that will make it take longer for the for the common to come back. Not saying it won't ever come back, but that's something you can do. But it's going to look ugly one in the process. It's not it's not a process where you're not it's not going to be obvious that you um, you did something to your lawn. So it, it might actually just be easier just to honestly live with it and use growth regulator to try and slow down the rate at which it grows to where it doesn't stand out quite as much um, in your lawn. So just something to can to consider. Tell you what, if someone, if someone ever cracks that one, they're going to make a whole lot of money, man. A way to selectively remove common Bermuda from hybrid Bermuda. That's a, um, that's a good one. That's a good problem to solve. All right. Uh, next up is Soldier, I think. Soldier's up next. He says, what's your recommendation to tackle 45,000 square feet of lawn? Wow. Uh, 15,000 square feet is Bermuda and the other is basically Weeze. Do I nuke and plug? I can't really afford to saw for sod that large of an area. So what are, you, what are your goals? So you've got, you know, under just under an acre um, of lawn. And so you got Bermuda and you got weeds. Are you trying to make it all Bermuda or are you trying to like, what is, what is it you're trying to do? I agree with you that sodding almost an acre is, um, is cost prohibitive. You could try growing, this is a case now where using grass seed could make more sense. Now I kind of doubt you have a way to water or irrigate that much that much land. Um, but if you're fine with you letting mother nature, just letting things kind of run their course, like you go out there and you you burn it all down, put grass seed out, um, and you know, try and time your grass seed whenever you see there's gonna be a bunch of rain in the forecast, that could be a way of somewhat economically trying to get um, like a, a consistent stand of grass over that large of an area. Uh, but it really depends on what you're trying to do. Like you said, you got the Bermuda and the way you're asking the question, it sounds like you want the Bermuda gone too. So um, so what, which, if, you, if you're still here, um, comment and let me know what kind of, which grass do you want to have? Do you want to have Bermuda everywhere or do you want to, um, you want to have something else? At, at any rate, uh, you know, grass, um, grass seed is likely going to be your, your bet from a, your best bet from like a, economical standpoint and the way you handle watering is if it's warm season if it's a warm season line you're going to want to put in put in there um is do it in the relatively early spring so like late april time frame when we still get a lot of rain and just hope that mother nature works with you to be where it gets enough water and it, and it grows in it grows in well um, as far as getting rid of the weeds um, to prepare for that, you can just use glyphosate. Like if you don't really care about, you're not trying to selectively control the weed, you're just trying to get rid of all, get, you know, burn it all down. In that case, glyphosate would be your friend. That's going to be the, the most economical way of, of cleaning that up. But again, you got 45,000 square feet, regardless of which route you go, it's going to be expensive. Even if you go grass seed, you're still talking a, about a lot of grass seed. You're talking probably several thousand dollars in, in grass seed um, to, to cover that much, um, that much square footage. So, so hope that helps soldier. If you're still here, you can you know, let me know what kind of grass you actually want to have, but hopefully what I've outlined gives you an idea of what you're going to like, what the process, um, could look like. All right. Next up is, um, uh, let's see, uh, quite a question here from, um, on Instagram from B, uh, BMBGC. Ron, have you started for fertilizer as yet? No, not as yet, but I will this weekend. I'll, I'll be spraying. I'll sp my, my, I'll be spraying uh, the 901C carbon kit um, on the on the front lawn this weekend. So the entire lawn will get uh, um, essential G, and the front lawn will get uh, the 901C carbon kit. And the way things are looking, the back lawn will likely get it like in a couple of weeks. So then they'll all be synced up, and we'll be, we'll be off to the races. All right, Brian Hall says, um, hey, Ron, happy Friday. I just got my mower out of the shop and I am ready for spring 2024. Yay for that. You know what? We'll clap it up. Yay! Use some doubt. All right. Uh, next up is Brian. He's back with another one. He says, um, hey, Ron and everyone in the chat, what is a good inexpensive insecticide pump sprayer? Um, you can find some decent ones. If all you're looking for is an expensive one, you can find some decent ones on, um, on Amazonia. Um, there is, hang on. There's one that's, it's, um, it's a pump, not pump, but it's got like, um, it's like a, it's like electric, like battery power, but it's, but it's like a handheld one. It's not like a backpack sprayer. I'm trying to see if I can find it here and tell you, but any, any of these, like you can get like a Chapin, you can get, I know you can't see what's on 
on my screen. But if all you're looking for is just like a like a, a basic sprayer, just for, you know, just spraying some insecticide, um, you're not going to be using it for like lawn apps and that kind of thing. Something like any of these would should would work all right. Um, would work all right, um, Brian. Um, so pump pump sprayers. Um, so that. Um, so take a look at look at those. There's one that I used to remember. I I could I, I was a fan of. That's like um, it was like it would pressurize it for you. It's like battery powered, but it's like a handheld one. Like, but I can't find it. I can't find it. I'm not seeing it here. Let me look a little longer. No, I don't. I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't see it. Maybe they don't carry it on Amazon anymore. Um. All right. Uh, next up, we have LT. Oh, you see, I'm in Florida. Cool. Good. Good stuff. Next up, we got LTX Shep. He's here. He's a question. He says, I have heavy clay. I aerate twice a year and the, the yard is hard like a rock. Is there a product you help you recommend to help soften the soil? Thanks. No, not really. Um, I mean, if you're manual, if you're aerating with um, like uh, like hollow tine aerating, that's that's a great tool for um for breaking up, you know, for, for relieving compaction. What you might consider doing, uh, Shep, is the next time you aerate, say if you can, if you can wait till like say um, April time frame, April May time frame, and you aerate, and then you can also top dress after doing that. That's going to help. That's the, that's a way to just to slowly begin changing the top part of the of the soil profile that will that will help reduce um, compaction continuing to be to be a thing. You know what I mean? I mean, there, some people will say you can use gypsum to help relieve compaction some, but if you're if you're doing aeration a couple times a year and it's still hard. Um, I would, I personally would consider doing a heavy aeration and then doing a top dressing afterwards, some sand, a nice sand compost blend. And that will, that will help slowly over time change the, uh, the soil profile to where you should have less issues with, um, with, with compaction because you're already doing the, the what I would recommend now, which is aerating. Okay. And uh, next up we got Brian Hall. Actually, I'm going to make, I'm going to save that one. Cause I'm sure other people are going to have that question. Like, Hey, how do I get rid of compaction in my lawn? Which is aerate it, man. That's what all the cool kids are doing. All right. Uh, next up we have caught that typo. Uh, next up is uh, Brian Hall. He says, uh, Hey Ron, what are your thoughts on Cujo yard shoes? Good or bad? Never use them. I can't say, I can't say for, um, for sure. I just I like my Nike Monarchs. I, I like those. Those work pretty well. So, um, but I can't I can't really speak to any of the brands of yard specific shoes. I've never used any of them to know how well they work or don't work. So, um, so yeah. Mark Loon is up next. He says, "Can you send the merch store link? I lost the link. Thanks, brother. Do I have that? I think I do. I think I can find it. Um, this is it here. I think. Let me double check. I don't want to send you in a wild goose chase." Um, Mark. Yeah, here we go. Cool. So this link is the link to the merch store. So at Mark Luna, uh, merch store. And I do need to, and I, I always keep saying I need to update it, but I just, I just time, man. I need like two, I need like two or three of me is the problem. He says, I need that green tea. You like that, man? You like the stripe action tea? I like it. It's one of my favorite tees. This, and then also, you know, Josh Habib gave me some really cool t-shirts like he had made, like once the green greens master on it and stuff. But I do like, it's it's hard to beat just the stripe action. It's a great conversational piece. You know, when your neighbors come by or your neighbors are probably gonna know, but like the company comes over and like, what does that mean? You're like, then they open the door for you, you know, to kind of go on and on about all the, the glory and awesomeness that is lawn care. You know what I mean? So just simple. All right, next up is Jeremy Espinoza. He says, just order Turfplex and Nutrizolve. Can't wait to use them. Might get NutriKelp. I don't know yet. Very nice, Jeremy. I like that combination. What I would tell you is if you're going to be using Turfplex and Nutrizolve together, the application rate on the bottle for Nutrizolve is six ounces per thousand. Um, if you're mixing it with Turfplex, I would back that down a little bit. Um, you know, the stuff's not inexpensive. And you got to remember that Turfplex already has some iron in it. So if you um, if you spray, if you mix Nutrizolve at six ounces per thousand, sorry, at three ounces per thousand, along with Turfplex at six ounces per thousand, that produces a really nice result. I've done that in the past when I was using Turfplex a lot, um, and that that works well. You get a little bit more 
you know, more coverage out of your bottle of Nutrizolve that way. Um, and that, um, that's, that's, that's what I would do. So three ounces per thousand um, on the Nutrizolve, six ounces per thousand on the Turfplex if you're mixing those two. If you're mixing Nutrizolve with the 901C Carbon Kit, in that case, you would spray it at six ounces per thousand because the Carbon Kit doesn't have um, like the iron and zinc and, and, um, and other micros that Turfplex does. So, uh, so yeah. Good stuff, man. It's a good combination. I like it. Uh, uh, the tip off classic says, um, uh, Hey Ron, mixing prodiamine and certainty. Do you still need surfactant? Um, I don't like to use, I don't, I don't, if I were mixing certainty and, and prodiamine, I would not, um, add surfactant uh, along with it. Reason being is that out of those two, uh, the prodiamine is more important to get a good result with really than the certainty. You could always follow up and, and spray certainty again a few weeks down the road if you need to, but because prodiamine is timing based, is soil temperature based to get um, the best out of it, you really don't want to be adding surfactant with that and, and you know having some of the product getting stuck to stuck to the grass, stuck to the to the weeds you're targeting. So if you're going to do Celsius, I'm sorry, if you're going to do certainty and prodiamine, um, there's no problem with mixing them. I've done that. I've done certainty, prodiamine, and Celsius, mix them all together. The only thing that, that I didn't do is I didn't add surfactant along with that mix, and it worked well. I got the pre-emergent worked well, and I got good control with the Celsius and certainty blend mixed along with that. So hope that helps. Uh, that will um, that should get you get you on the right track. Um, but if you're if you're applying it separately, let's say if you were just doing certainty by itself, then yes, I would use surfactant absolutely with that. And if you're, you know, using, if you're mixing certainty and Celsius, I would also use surfactant as well, surfactant as well with that. It's really, if you're mixing pre-emergent with it, that, um, that I'm not a fan of doing it. There's people that do it, but I, I'm a fan of not doing that for the reasons that I explain and hopefully that makes, uh, makes sense to you. Okay. Soldier says, I want Bermuda everywhere and no, I only have irrigation on the Bermuda right now. Okay, yeah, so, okay, so if you, so here's the thing. The Bermuda, it, it, I don't know if the Bermuda that you currently have is from sod, but if you are gonna try and get Bermuda over the rest of the, I think you said 15,000 square feet is Bermuda, so the remaining 30,000 square feet, then you gotta be prepared for that, for the idea that the seeded area is not gonna match the hybrid area. So I'm assuming that what you, the 15,000 square feet you have is probably near the house, probably surrounding the house, like most people tend to do. Um, and the rest of it is just like open area. So if you are gonna go the grass seed route, just know that the 15,000 square feet of Bermuda that's that's there now is gonna look a little bit different to the rest of the lawn. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's just gonna be the way, to, that's just the way it's gonna be. There's not really gonna be a, um, I mean, outside of of using ensuring you're using the exact same sod that you have on the existing lawn, it's it's going to be pretty tough to ensure that it matches. And you said, I guess the other section of, I guess e either section out the sod over the next couple of years for affordability or seed, like you said, yeah. But I think here's the thing: even with sod, unless you are using, you're certain you're using the exact same sod, and ideally you're using the same sod, getting the sod from the same place as um, what you currently have in your lawn, there's no guarantee that it's gonna match. So I've personally seen where like, you know, most of the lawns around here are Tifway 419, right? That's what they, that's what the builders install. And where you are, you replace a section of the lawn that used, um, that, that, that is bare for whatever reason, right? So you're removing a tree or whatever happens, happens to be and you're replacing that area with Tifway 419 sod. If the sod comes from somewhere else, I've seen them not match, even though they're supposedly both Tifway 419. So, you know, unless you're going to be getting, if you go the sod route, um, if you, unless you're getting it from the same, you're getting this, the same cultivar and you're getting it from the same place, you, that there's not even with that a 100% uh, guarantee that it's going to match up, you know, match up well. So it just, it just really depends on which way you're, um, you really want to go about it. I mean, it's, it, at any rate, it's going to be expensive because you're talking about seeding or sodding like 30,000 square feet is not gonna be cheap either, you know, either way. The only thing I'm trying to tell you is that if you go the seed route, just be prepared that it may not match, or not may, it's, it's unlikely to match your existing Bermuda lawn. So, which is not that big of a deal. I mean, you figure if it's, if you got 15,000 square feet around the house and then it gets to be a different kind of Bermuda look, you know, outside from the house, eh, I mean, you're not gonna really see it as much. I mean, as long as you don't take a drone shot, no one's really gonna notice. 
Okay, uh, next up, um, uh, It's Me says, how can you tell hybrid uh, versus common Bermuda? That's a good question. So hybrid Bermuda is, it's um, the leaf tends to be finer. Um, the, um, what else can I tell you? This leaf tends to be finer. Um, the runners, the stolons aren't as thick. Like if you look at the, 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 the stolons, the runners for common Bermuda, they tend to be thicker and um, the leaf is thicker. Common Bermuda, to me, to my eye, has more of a um, more of a limish green color, whereas hybrids are darker in color. But the easiest way to tell is is going to be just looking at the leaf, the leaf blade. Like Common Bermuda, um, the leaf is is typically quite a bit bigger. Um, another thing with Common Bermuda is that you might also find that um, that it can sometimes um, have like a per, like near near the stolen, near when it, like a, a new shoot is coming out it can have like a purplish color to it a little bit, whereas hybrid won't have that. So the leaf texture, the color, um, the, um, um, and then also, yeah, so that's the biggest thing, the, 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 the leaf, the, the thickness of the leaf, um, the, the stolons are gonna be quite a bit thicker for common Bermuda than hybrid. Um, and it's, it just it also tends to be not as dense. It doesn't get as thick or as dense as, um, as hybrid does. So it's, it's it's gonna be pretty obvious if you got Alana's primarily hybrid Bermuda and you start having some common growing in it, it's gonna it's gonna be fairly apparent to which which uh, which grass is uh, is which. So um I, I should you know it's one thing. I don't have a pic, I don't actually have a picture of common Bermuda. I'll have to get some pictures and actually show you um, um it's me 2017, but that's that's a, a good way of knowing it. I mean the 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 telltale sign is the the stolons the runners for hybrid Bermuda are a lot are quite a bit they are noticeably thicker than what they are for hybrid like hi, everything about hybrid is finer the leaf is finer the stolons are finer the color is darker in color the green is darker in color whereas common the leaf is thicker it's like a thicker leaf um, and it can also sometimes have a, a purplish tinge near the base where it connects to the um, where it shoots off the stolon. Um, the stones themselves are thicker. It's just, it, and the color is typically not as dark as of green. It tends to be more of a of a limeish green color, I find, than um, than hybrid. So, um, so yeah. Uh, so next up, we got Victor uh, Gonzalez. He says, um, "Good evening, Ron. Hope you are well. Quick question: When would you dethatch and or scarify Bermuda? Um, dethatch, I would not." I really wouldn't do it um, for most lawns, and then scarifying it. Um, you know, once the once the lawn is growing, um, you can and you if you want to, if you're talking about regular scarification, then you can do it whenever the lawn is actively growing. I mean, I I've done it on my lawn on, in the um, in the fall and winter months mainly because I like how it looks as far as like how how nice the stripes um, appear. But there's not really a lot of um, not really a lot of there's not really any benefit. Because to doing that when the lawn is dormant because it's not it's not really growing. Uh, the thing I tell you, Victor, is if you're going to scarify, um, set the scarifier up like set it up to where the the tines are not getting into the soil. Most people, when they go out and they scarify or turf rake their lawn, they set up the scarifier way too aggressively to where it's just causing it's it's tearing up the grass. It's getting you know it's, it's just it's just pulling up a lot of a lot of the um, the stolons. It's, it creates more of a mess than is necessary. If you set the the scarifier up to where it's you know it's two to four millimeters above the surface, what you're going to find is it's going to gently remove a lot of the debris out of the lawn, like clippings and that kind of stuff. Um, it's going to really it's going to set some beautiful stripes, um, and so you get a lot of the benefits without really any of the negatives. So case in point, if you look at I mean ignore the big puddle in the lawn. If you look at that right there, what you're looking at is that lawn has been turf raked, like where the light, the stripes are light, that's me turf raking away from where we're looking. And where the stripes are dark, that's me turf raking towards where um, I am. And if you want to see, if you want to see it done like all live and see how I set it all up, I've got a live stream from last year, if I can find it, where I turf rake, verticut, and then I mow it. I turf rake, verticut, I put essential G um, and I mow it and I put essential G down. Like it's like a full, I'd like the full thing to show you like how I go about doing it. And I show exactly how it's all set up and and all this kind of jazz. So I'm gonna I'm gonna find that for you really quick because you'll get some guidance out of how I like to do it to get a good result. Here we go. May of 2023. All right, so take a look at this. Um let's see, uh let's see here. So at Victor. Um 
verticutting and scarifying process. And, scare. and and this this video was shot. This live stream was shot at the end of um, at the end of May, so that gives you an idea of as far as timing goes. So yeah, so check out that that live stream. Um, again, this is from last year, and you, hopefully you get some uh, some value some value out of that. He says Tito Serrano says, "Do you have to dethatch before you before leveling? Um, if you don't, how?" Can the lawn be level with thatch on the ground? I don't know. To answer your question, no. You don't have to dethatch before leveling. I am a fan of reducing the height of cut a bit. It makes it easier for you to work the material into the um, into the into the soil, into the canopy, and identify low and high spots in the uh, in the lawn tito. And as far as you know, thatch or debris, like I am not a fan of having a bunch of that in the lawn before you you go out and do a leveling project. So that's why. Again, if you look at my lawn over the years, um, when I started doing regular turf raking and verticutting, the lawn like went up. It totally it went up a complete notch as far as like how much better it looked, um, and because it it prevented a lot of what you're talking about as far as like debris buildup, thatch, all that kind of stuff, um, and as far as leveling, literally all you have is the grass standing up and then the soil. So as far as leveling, it makes it really easy. So dethatching, no. Um, if you want to do a light scalp and get the, you know, get the, the turf a little bit shorter to where you can really work that, that tougher, that leveling mix into the soil, I'm a fan of doing that because it helps produce a better result. So, uh, so again, I so hope that's useful for you. Um, dethatching is not strictly, um, strictly necessary. Like most people don't, don't dethatch before they, um, they top dress their lawn. Most, depending on, and it also depends on how high your lawn is, right? So say you're maintaining your lawn at like three quarters of an inch. There's not really a whole lot you have to do. You can just get out there and just go just top dress it. It's really if you got a lawn that's, you know, an inch and a quarter, inch and a half. Can you still top dress that? Yes, but it's it's gonna be a lot more work. Like working using a leveling rake on taller grass is more of a headache. Getting getting the top dressing material, the leveling mix to settle down, because when you put it put it down, it's gonna kind of be sitting on top of the grass. And then when you hit it with the leveling rake, that's gonna start knocking it down where it starts falling into the low spots. It is a lot easier to do that when the grass is shorter than when it is, um, you know, an inch and a half, two inches tall. So if anything, I'd say lower your height of cut, um, but st not strictly necessary to do any kind of a dethatching prior to um, to, uh, to your top dressing work. Okay, uh, next up is, uh, it's me. He says the home was built in 2018, if that helps, North um, North Dallas, Fort Worth. What was your question earlier? It's me. You're not, you're not the one that's talking about the big um, project, is it? Um, yeah, I'm not, I, I forget. I forget the context around around the question you're asking. Um, but if it was built in 2018, it's more than as far as the kind of grass you have. It's more than likely like Tiffway 419, unless you paid to have something else brought in. It's more than likely. And if you're sure it's Bermuda, it's more than likely Tiffway 419 because that's what most most places um, install because it's not it's, it's not a, a super expensive um, as far as the hybrids go, it's not crazy expensive to um, to put in. So that's, if I were a betting man, that's more than likely what you have. All right, so next up we have um, da, 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 da. he says a picture comparison would be great. Yeah, I'll I'll work on that for um I'll work on that for next week. Um, it's me. Uh, but the the big thing is that just hang on if I can find if I can find it I should Google should be able to tell me this let's see if we can find common Bermuda versus let's see there's a picture um, visually they look they look um, they look different let me see if I can find like a side by side um, uh, da, 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 da. no one there's no side by sides. <laughs> Not that I'm not that I'm seeing here. Um, no, no, I'll, I'll work on it. I'll work on it um, for you um, for next week. Um, it's me. But the, but common Bermuda is is it's it's a it's a thicker um, leaf blade. It's not as dense. The color tends to be also not as 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 dark as the hybrids. Um, yeah, so. So that I'll, but I'll, I'll work on, I'll work on getting a, a picture comparison for you. So I can get that, if I can get that for you for next week and get, have a small area to show that while, um, while Devin's on it. Next week is primarily going to be for the cool season, our cool season brethren and sisterin. Uh, but, um, but yeah, we can see, we can work out a, um, 
to work it out for you. If, if you want, you know what? Actually, it's me, 2017. If you want, send me an email, um, ron at golfcourselawn.com right here, and I'll get you um, I'll get you some pictures. I'll find some pictures of like common Bermuda and hybrid Bermuda, and I'll email them to you so you can, you can see for yourself. Because probably not everyone wants to see that. They're like, eh, whatever. We don't really care. Um, the big thing is this too. It doesn't really matter because at this point, what you have is what you have. You know, I mean, it'd be nice if you want to know that just for your own, I guess, edification, that, that'd be one thing. But I mean, it's if you had a house and it was built in 2018, um, more than likely it's going to be hybrid Bermuda. Like they're going to, it's more than likely going to be, they, they use sod. Um, and it's, if it's, if that's what they did, it's going to be Tifway 419, unless you paid to have something else, um, installed. So, um, so yeah. All right, so we have our, I think our last question of the evening. This was going to be from Mr. Daniel Tomas Enriquez. He says, a yard has huge established weeds. Do I spray post-emergent, <clears throat> then let it sit, then pull the weeds? Mm. Uh, yeah, Daniel, that's a, that's a strategy. So what I would say is this, you may not even have to pull them. Um, you can use a, an appropriate post-emergent herbicide um, for the weeds. And then what you could do is instead of pulling them, is uh, just mow the lawn, but bag everything up. So like, make sure you catch all the debris uh, that's that that comes off the lawn after you um when when you're mowing it. So that's a that's an easier way from getting like the old. I mean, you said it sounds like you have some big big weeds where you're talking like established ones. That's a, that's an easier way of getting rid of them versus getting out there and trying to pull you know you know pull up an entire lawn. Just just go ahead and uh, spray an appropriate herbicide. Let it work as the weed. Once the weeds are uh, have died off, then you can just mow it and again put a bagger on and make sure you, you get all the debris. And that's a that's an easier way of of doing what you're what you're trying to accomplish there. Good question. That's a good question. I guess the question, another question for you, Daniel. Not that we're judging or anything, but why do you, why is your lawn full of established weeds? Are you, are you just moving in, or what are we doing here? Is it just you just trying to you trying to turn the lawn around? What like what happened? Where did you fall short that it caused the lawn to get to this state of disrepair? Hmm? That's, what, that's what we really need to talk about. That's, that's the big question. But that's a question for another day. All right, guys, gals, I think that is pretty much it. Hopefully you guys got some value out of the live stream. And if not, at least it was hopefully entertaining. Um, this week, if you guys care about what I'm be doing this weekend, um, spraying uh, the carbon kit on the front lawn and Essential G over the entire lawn because it's it's time to get the 2024 season uh, rolling. And it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be good times, and um, looking looking forward to it. So on that note, we'll cue the outro music. And um, let's see here. Daniel says it's a rental home we moved into. I got you. Okay, so you just you're 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 picking it up and you're trying to get it together. I get you. I got you. Hopefully that helps, sir. Again. You know, get, knock back the weeds, get a mower, put um, catch all the all the, the the clippings and debris. That way, if there's any kind of seed heads or anything like that, you get all that instead of like blowing it all over the lawn. And that's an easier way of accomplishing what you're uh, you're trying to do. Guys, gals, again, thank you guys so much for watching. I truly, truly do appreciate you guys taking the time to come hang out with me on a Friday night. Again, the golf course lawn store is open. We have everything um in stock get your central g get your fertilizers for the season and uh i will see you guys next week have an amazing weekend until next time take care <laughs>